matter before the committee is H.R. 2950 from the Committee on Public Works and Transportation and Ways and Means, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Infrastructure Act. Uh, today the committee meets to hear testimony and grant a rule on H.R. 2950, the Intermodal Service Transportation Infrastructure Act of 1991, better known as the Highway Bill. <clears throat> to some people, infrastructure is a synonym, synonym for pork. True, not every dollar is spent on bricks and mortar that is productive, but this particular bill represents a very long-term investment in our future, a real contribution to the nation's wealth and health fair. <laughs> A July 1991 study by the Congressional Budget Office entitled How Federal Spending for Infrastructure and Other Public Investments Affects the Economy notes that carefully chosen federal involvements in physical infrastructure, such as a highway and aviation program, would yield economic rates of return higher than the average return on private capital. So as a rule, the highest economic benefits would result from maintaining existing infrastructure and from expanding capacity in highly congested facilities. More than 60% of the miles of paved highway in the United States are in need of repair. Congestion is a growing problem. Almost 70% of the daily peak hour travel of the, on the urban interstate system is under congested conditions. By the next decade, traffic delays caused by inadequate roads will cost the nation $50, $50 billion a year in lost productivity, wages, and gasoline. As federal spending on highways, bridges, and airports steadily declined from the light, late 1960s through the 80s, the rate of growth in U.S. productivity declined at roughly the same rate. West Germany and Japan invest almost twice our share of GNP in public works, and their productivity has grown at nearly two and a half times our rate. The bill before us today is intended to provide the necessary funding to adequately maintain our highways and bridges and to provide additional capacity. Granted, the bill is not without controversy. The number of witnesses at this hearing makes that point clear. There is opposition to the gas tax. There is opposition to different elements of the spending package. There are changes here and there that various members hope to offer amendments to. In my personal view, while many of these amendments may be meritorious, this is an excellent bill on the whole. Still, it's my hope and intention that the committee will craft a rule to allow full and fair debate on all the issues, at the same time ensuring that the House can complete its action on the bill for leaving, before leaving for the August recess. Uh, with that introduction, I'd like to turn now to the, my friend and the ranking minority member of the committee, the Honorable Jerry Solomon, New York. Mm -hmm. Jerry? Well, Mr. Chairman, let me explain to the members that uh, the way you bang that gavel at opening this meeting uh, I can attest to the fact of, of why you did it the way you did it, and that's because I had breakfast with uh, Joe Moakley this morning, and he had his Wheaties with Secretary Brady over the uh, Secretary of Treasury. And uh, let, me, let me just say to, to all of the members that are here that, uh, you know, there's been some problem as to why, you know, we were delayed uh, with this rule and getting this bill on the floor, not only this bill, but the unemployment insurance bill as well. And there was a, a serious problem as to how we would proceed under under the rules of the House, which we all adopt and vote for. And I just want to say that most of those problems on this bill and the unemployment insurance bill have been really worked out. Um, and I want to commend Joe Moakley and the Speaker uh, for sitting down and, and, and working out these problems between the majority and minority. And although we will still argue perhaps over uh, how the, the rule will be uh, we developed, uh, uh, certain amendments, uh, we certainly want to uh, proceed with the business of the House. And again, I want to thank the Chairman and the rest of the members of this committee. And congratulations you. to you gentlemen on getting your bill before us. At this thank time, the committee will be very happy to hear from the uh, Honorable Chairman, the Honorable Robert Rowe of New Jersey, the Honorable John Paul Hemmerschmidt of Arkansas, and the Honorable Bud Schuster of Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman. We want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us the time and the opportunity to appear before you. What we thought we'd do, with your permission, of course, is make a graphic uh, presentation. Then, then I'd like to have the opportunity. I think it would be very helpful to the committee to run two, three, two or three charts, which will bring the bill into focus. Fine. So, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Committee on Public Works and Transportation, I thank you and your colleagues for holding the hearing on, and on, on an expedited basis for H.R. 2950, the Intermodal Service Transportation Act 1991. We consider this bill to be one of the most significant to be considered during the 102nd Congress 
Therefore, we are departing from the usual public works. Therefore, we are departing from the usual public works and transportation committee practice, and we're requesting a modified open rule. At the outset, let me pay my high regards and great compliments to my colleagues, uh, John Paul Hammersmith, our ranking member from Arkansas, and our distinguished uh, ranking member from Pennsylvania, Bud Schuster, on the subcommittee, Norma Mineta, as you know, is on the floor now, who's chairman of our subcommittee on transportation, who's done, they've all done an extraordinary, excellent job. And I think the fact, Mr. Chairman, that we're appearing here today, and this bill is a totally bipartisan bill, speaks to the uh, dynamics, if you like, of the committee and the sincerity of the efforts we're trying to put forth. Surface transportation infrastructure investment proposed in H.R. 2950 is absolutely crucial to our nation's transportation system, the future economic growth, air pollution reduction goals, and energy conservation. H.R. 2950 is more than just a transportation bill. It is an economic environmental policy that will determine the quality of life in this nation in the coming decades throughout the development of a national intermodal transportation system. Our bill provides equity, flexibility, and resources to meet our transportation needs for the next five years. Public Works and Transportation Committee has worked for two and a half years on this bill, with hearings in Washington throughout the country, at least 50 to 100 hearings, uh, both here in Washington and throughout the country, in every corner of this nation. We have consulted with all the members all of the members that we have, that in the House we've consulted with, we've reviewed every letter and every communication that has come to our committee, and every piece of legislation that's been induced, introduced by members that had to do with transportation has been thoroughly reviewed by the committee. The infrastructure needs are well documented. Department of Transportation itself, as you mentioned in your opening statement, released a report uh, about a month ago, it was July the 2nd, wasn't even a month ago, July the 2nd, which said, and this is an important point, which we'll show you on that chart when we get to it, with the, that in order to maintain the conditions of our bridges and highways at 1989 level, without any improvement, any improvements, period, would cost, in their own statement from the administration, $42 billion a year. Significantly more would be needed to improve the conditions by 1989. In this bill, and we'll get into that a little later, in this bill we authorize $153 billion for transportation infrastructure investment, $121.5 billion for highways, and $32 billion for transit. Extremely important, $32 billion for transit, which locks into the Clean Air Act. We create a new national highway system, but also provide local officials with increased authority to make funding decisions in their own areas, including the transfer of funds to transit projects if that is in the interest of that state. We have developed a truly, we like to refer to as an all-American bill that meets the needs of every part of the country, rural, suburban, and urban alike. We've authorized new high-priority corridors to fill gaps in the existing interstate system. We authorize completion of the interstate highway system, and we propose a doubling of the amount to be invested in the development of mass transit systems. It is absolutely essential in our judgment that for our nation that we have this new transportation policy to promote economic growth. Our added infrastructure investment will create two million jobs and will provide the foundation for our industry's competition in the global economy. We're requesting your support for a modified open rule, including a committee and block amendment, making technical and other changes to the bill. We're requesting two hours of general debate to be divided 90 minutes for the Committee on Public Works and Transportation and 30 minutes for the Committee on Ways and Means if that meets your, your needs and your determination. We appreciate your consideration on this bill and, are willing, and your willingness to help us move this bill on a fast track. This bill, in our judgment, is crucial to the economic future, and we greatly appreciate our country and greatly appreciate your uh, support. May I now defer to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. John Paul Hammer, Hammersmith from the great state of Arkansas. The chair recognizes the distinguished member from Arkansas, Mr. Hammersmith. Mr. Chairman, uh, before the Chairman makes his chart presentation. Let me say very briefly that I totally support Chairman Rowe's request for a modified open rule. I agree with him totally that this has been a bipartisan effort. We reported out of our committee, 49 to 7. And let me just say things that you already know, but let me remind you that 35 years ago, we passed the largest public works project in the history of the world when we passed the Defense Highway Network legislation under President Eisenhower which is now called the Eisenhower Interstate System. Of 
course, that 43,000 miles that now exist is part of this total plan. It must be continued to be restored, rehabilitated, kept up to date, as well as expanding the rest of the highway system. Just one other comment, oversimplification perhaps, and it, it deals with our Title VII, which of course is ways and means jurisdiction. But let me just say this about the nickel tax. If a person, the average citizen, drives 15,000 miles a year, gets 20 miles to the gallon, that equates in cost to him at a nickel at 37.50 a year. That's 72 cents a week. I just want to make that relative to the actual cost of the average working man. It isn't all that great. Uh, so I totally support the chairman, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and the committee today. The Honorable Bud Schuster. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would strongly associate myself with the remarks of the two gentlemen here at the table. Simply make two points. First, that uh, our strong support of this legislation is predicated upon the nickel for America being a clean nickel that is dedicated to transportation and spent for transportation. As we speak, our staffs are working with the Ways and Means Committee to be sure that that is what is intended in the legislation passed out by the Ways and Means Committee last night. And so this matter is of enormous importance to us. Uh, so, and the second and final point I would make is that we've met uh, not only with the Speaker and the Majority Leader yesterday, but with the Republican Leader late yesterday afternoon. And we believe we uh, can recommend uh, to the Rules Committee a motion to recommit, uh, which protects the, uh, the minority, which uh, the Minority Leader supports, and which will give uh, those who are opposed to the Nickel for America a clean up or, not, up or down vote on that particular very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Charts. Any uh, I have Our charts. Oh, do you want us to show them? Of course. Okay. We prepared them to show them to you. <laughs> it's a pride here. <laughs> Can you give me? I think it's worth taking a few minutes on this because it graphically explains exactly what we're doing. The room should be a little bit larger than the chair. Well, the charts may be a little smaller. Massachusetts, I believe, and New Jersey. Just quickly, so you go through it. The way the program is divided down and why this is important for you to understand it, if you can see it. Over here, the national highway system. Some people said that we shouldn't eliminate any more highways built in the country. This is, in our opinion, a very short-sighted approach, even though we're finishing the interstate uh, program now. And particularly in the bill we have at 16 cars that connect new growth areas of the country has to be done. So we have allocated 50%, approximately 50% of the funding would go into the national highway system, both to repair and improve and build additional areas we need. I think it's important to point out here that there's a provision in the bill that comes back and says that we have established 155,000 miles as a general national highway program, and the Senate has 188. That will go for two years. We're giving the department the right to review that in two years, but they must meet with the states and debate with the states and discuss with the states, present it back to the Public Works Committee so the Public Works Committee can review, have hearings on it, and determine whether that's the right thing to do. So we're protecting all the states in that direction. There's been an argument and a misconcern on my judgment as to how the formulas would be. One of the issues we were working with here diligently was that there had to be an equitable system to all states. It was only fair. There's been a, a, a different proposal that has been pre pre presented, as you know, by our good friend uh, Charlie and uh, came back and said, well, we think we can do this better in a different way, and they call it the FAST program. We met with those folks, and we worked very, very closely with them, particularly as a number of members on our committee. We've absorbed a number of the, or most of the areas that they were concerned we have taken care of and absorbed. That's number one. This flexible pot of 17%, the governors can use this pot and transfer that funding to whether it's urban or whether it's rural or even the national highway system. That's the flexibility given to the governor to decide. In the urban mobility area, we're providing 17% of the money for urban problems. This is terribly important. The real heart of this bill, in large measure, is the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act comes back and says that if you're a non-conforming non state, you can lose your highway money after two and a half years if you haven't done something in the non-attainment area, I should say, to clean up your air pollution and so forth. We're providing the resources to begin to move in that direction. 
rural mobility the same thing. We're providing the resources for rural America to make its decisions and also in the flexibility of 4% of the funding was allocated for flexibility as far as safety is concerned. In addition to that, out of this national highway system, the governor could transfer unilaterally, if he needed it, he or she needed it, either into the urban mobility pot, they could transfer part of it into the rural mobility part, they could do it in either one of the pots. So we're giving the optimum situation to the states to make the determinations under the bill and under the, uh, the process so they have an input into how we uh, can go ahead and build it up to 25% out of the rest of it. So basically, that's the heart of the bill. The issue was equity. The issue was flexibility. We believe we provided that in this particular proposal. Chairman, do you have Yes, of course. You might get confused by that chart. You're looking at 49% on the National Highway System. There's another 17% for rural states that weren't all on highways, which really gives them 67%. But I can't figure out if it all adds up to 100%. <laughs> the transit funding levels, one of the problems we've had at the transit funding levels, the level the administration had asked for was $3.2 billion across the board. When the president made his speech, and I think it was March 10th, and he came before the House at the end of Desert Storm, he said that one of his key issues uh, on his agenda was the transportation issue, and that we had to reduce our energy problems and, and what have you in that direction, which we agree with him. But unfortunately, when the presentation was made to us, they only provided $3.2 billion a year for all the transit programs in the country. It's virtually impossible to meet the level of the Clean Air Act and be moving towards transit programs with that level of funding. In great negotiations amongst the committee, we knew that it had to be doubled, and we in our bill have this now raised to $6.4 billion in, in the transit area, affecting and benefiting all states. Just one more chart, and I'll get you out of the way. This perhaps is the most graphic chart that we could produce for you, and it's going to be used tomorrow on the floor, or whenever you get us the rule and get us to the floor. The point that you were making, we, when we had commissioned the Department of Transportation to overview the entire needs of the country and consolidate that in a substantive report to, re to report back to the committee and tell us what they really believe the needs of the country to be. In that report, there are two or three highly significant issues. Here is the level that the administration has recommended for the highway pro, I beg pardon, well, yes, for the highway program. This was their level of funding. This is where the nickel for America comes in. This is the level, the black line here, that the committee is recommending, which subsumes or includes the nickel for America. We're coming back and saying this chose, this chart indicates the 43 billion that the administration said just to maintain the system at 1989 levels, both in transit and in the highway program, this would be the minimal expense if you were to bring the system up to what it should be and get it to be a top drawer system of transportation, intermodal in the country, it would take twice that much. We're trying to come back and say this should not be a political argument. This is not a political thing we're fighting with. That's why we've got total bipartisan effort on this committee. We're coming back and saying if this is what you need just to maintain us at 1989 level, and we're down here, and even the wisdom of the committee here, no way begins to meet the needs that are required as far as the country is concerned. Why is that important to us? The reason it's important is we're coming back and saying, we found our, our systems, our transportation system to be bifurcated. We don't connect our airports. We don't connect our harbors. There isn't any intermodality of substance. That's what the fundamental core of this bill is about. We're coming back and saying if it's true that we're now in a, a major economic piece of legislation and we're talking about where the country goes, for every dollar that we invest in the transportation system, we get $10 back in capital for every dollar we invest. This is not a tax bill. This is an investment bill in the future of this country. That's what we're talking about. And again, not even beginning to meet the needs that we already know about. Finally, we're coming back and we're saying to, trying to say to the Congress, and hopefully to the White House and to the rest of the country, the argument should not be over whether we can afford to spend the nickel for America. The argument should be over, can we not afford to do it and be able to stay competitive? 
Now there's a recent, a recent publication that came out and said that the nickel for America is a regressive tax and therefore it's gonna fall on the middle class and it's going to fall on the poor to be able to pay that tax, therefore it is not being fair. And I hope when that debate comes up on the floor, the response is gonna be as follows. Well, if we extol the virtue of what we were able to achieve under President Eisenhower in building the interstate system in the first place, how did we build it? We built it with the nickels that went into it. So it was regressive then, it was regressive, would be regressive now. Obviously, the argument doesn't stick as far as we're concerned. We're coming back and saying the greatest achievement in this world of any transportation in the whole world is the one that's been achieved by this country under the interstate program. Finally, let me close on this point. Is it regressive as far as the poor and middle class is concerned? And is everybody all hung up as far as this nickel for America is concerned? We're coming back and saying that the people that live in the cities can't get to their jobs if they don't have a transit system. The people in the cities can't get to the suburbs where the jobs are if they don't have a transit system. So we are saying to them that if you do not move in this direction, we're, we're creating a much greater economic problem in our country. Let me close on this point. In every place we've been, whether it's been in Massachusetts or California or New Jersey or Florida, the whole thing we're talking about, we found that industry has said to us that if you improve this system, we could save 48, 58 to 78 billion dollars a year just by improving the efficiency system in the country, as John Paul has pointed out. That's what this battle is about. Unfortunately, and I've got to say this because it should be said, the press have concentrated on the nickel for America and the, and the tax. And the press is concentrated on whether or not members' projects are in this bill, and isn't this a terrible thing? Hopefully, we'll get into depth discussion on the floor. Without the resources to achieve the goal we're talking about, the goals cannot be achieved. So I want to thank you for your indulgence and want to be able to make that presentation. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a very lucid presentation. Uh, Mr. Derrick? Uh, Bob. I, I think you probably went over all of this on the charts, and maybe I missed it, but uh, what percentage of the total expenditure uh, is devoted to the uh, experimental projects? There's approximately, you're talking experimental projects? Well, the demonstration projects. Right? Demonstration right. projects. Right. There are other names for them, but right. that's what we're thinking. <laughs> the, the overall bill would uh, designate approximately $6.8 billion, and it's approximately 5% of the bill. What's less than 5 4 point. That's 5% over what period of time? Over five years. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Oh, sorry, Mr. Solomon. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Chairman, let me just uh, again tell you how much uh, we respect all of you having been on your committee and um, know the great job that you do. I just want to. Uh, I, I guess this is not the, uh, maybe the appropriate place to talk about the, the tax portion of the bill. I, I hope Mr. Rostenkowski is going to be here later and uh, maybe some other members from the Ways and Means Committee. But um, I am uh, confused, like many members are, over uh, what was uh, given to us uh, uh, from the action that the Ways and Means Committee took by a 1917 vote last night. and. Uh, are, are you three in agreement with what they did? Uh, or was it an accommodation to get it going, to get it on the floor, to get it over to the other body? Oh, no, uh, no, we've been working very closely. And uh, again, as our bipartisan team here, our understanding of the situation is that the nickel for America should be the gross nickel for America going into the trust fund. That is our understanding, and that's the intent of it. There seems to be. A uh, question on that because the the paperwork hasn't been been finished as yet, and we're working on that issue now to ensure that we go in that direction. And That's sure, what our intent is. That, that must be clarified. That must be you clarified. put your finger on an excellent point. It must be clarified. We're together on that. It's got to be a nickel that's got to be spent for transportation. If it isn't, there's no deal. Well, that's uh, Mr. Hammersmith. Go ahead. I totally agree with what what both gentlemen have just said. Because it is confusing. Well, the, because, whole, you know, the, whole bill, the whole bill is, is uh, prefaced on the idea that we, we get a nickel in, we get $33 billion in, and we spend it all for transportation. Now, that it's not frozen in place or anything else. The whole thesis here is that the people are 
we're asking our folks to spend a nickel for America where the money must be expended now, not frozen into any trust funds or any artificial caps. Or diverted to some or diverted uh, to general anything general else. No, that's what's the, we're, otherwise there's no purpose in what we're attempting to achieve. Okay. Well, we won't pursue it then until, until they get up here, but uh, the, uh, you mentioned uh, what, we, what we might also consider is you're asking for 90 minutes, uh, I guess, for the Public Works Committee and, uh, and 30 minutes for Ways and Means. That's up to you folks to decide. Uh, Whatever you decide will be satisfactory. Well, all I'm saying to you is that you want to pass your bill. You want to get it enacted into law. And, you know, <laughs> if it's going to be this confusing on that tax issue, and if you want to pick up some votes for it, you really are going to have to clarify that in the eyes of a lot of a lot of members. And while we're on that subject, committee uh, agrees with you. Yeah, there are there are a number of amendments that have been proposed by Mr. Dreyer, Mr. McEwen, and uh, uh, plus a number on the other side of the aisle as well. And you talked about an in block amendment, and you mentioned a modified open rule when you started off. And uh, uh, are you opposed to any of these amendments uh, being? Debated on the floor. I'm not opposed to any minute being made. I, I want to call the gentleman's attention. The reason we're calling for a modified rule, a goodly number of the items that people have written to us on, we've subsumed into the committee and block amendment. Mm -hmm. Though we have done that already. We have talked with uh, every, well, just about everyone on these issues. So where we mm -hmm. felt that, and I, let me share with you, there was a number of amendments that people had proposed that were not within our jurisdiction. We put nothing in this legislation that's not within our jurisdiction. So there's some jurisdictional problem. But every place that we could absorb what we can, we've done it where it was reasonably uh, sound as far as the bill was concerned. Yeah, I yield to the gentleman from California. Thank you, my friend, for yielding. And uh, the chairman is absolutely right that we've had uh, discussions on the issues. I think uh, certainly the amendment that Mr. Bennett and I plan to offer has been discussed with you and your people. Uh, in light of the fact that you have taken many of the amendments that have been proposed, it seems to me that there would be no concern then about having an open rule to discuss this if these amendments have already been included. Well, in th this, this bill, you better give us seven or eight hours at that point because we have we've held at least a hundred hearings in, in, in Washington and throughout the country. I mean, you know, and the, the we've made amendment adjustments in subcommittee. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of amendments in full committee. But I'm simply saying to you, in our judgment, because we feel we've, we've really scrubbed this thing thoroughly, that uh, that's My friend, further it. yield, it just seems to me that if we're in a position now where you've addressed all the concerns and there should be no, no problem at all with having an open rule, there wouldn't be that many amendments that would be offered? Well, we think it would probably be more convenient for the uh, Rules Committee to have a modified I'd rule. I'd just, just like to remind the member, the last time we gave you an open rule, it took two days. I didn't bring that up. You did. We've acted in good oh, faith, yeah. Mr. Chairman, to accommodate, yeah. members, to accommodate yeah. members, and if and if that effort at accommodation goes for naught, then What's perhaps that? we should not make any accommodation and let the battle be fought and won or lost on the floor. And if, I could, if I could just to reclaim my time for a minute, I might just point out to my good chairman. I think when it took two days, I think it became law. The point I'm trying to make here is, uh, you know, we we've got some serious problems, and you people. You, you have dealt with it, and you know how to do it, and I commend you for it. But, you know, we had a striker replacement bill, you know, before the Congress the other day. And we had a situation where labor was totally inflexible, business was totally inflexible, there were no amendments to that bill, and consequently that bill, uh, when it does wind its way to the President, will be vetoed and will be sustained, and nobody will have gained. And I hate like hell to see that happen to your bill. Well, and that's why I'm saying there, there are some really meaningful amendments here. That, uh, that really ought to be considered. And that's why I ask you the question, would you oppose them if during our debate we decided well, to make some Well, I think that if, uh, in due respect and meaning it, you know, sincerely, if I've worked with you for so long, what, the, I leave that to the Rules Committee. Uh, where we're coming from, if you're going to give us 50 amendments, I'm going to try to finish this bill. We have acted in good faith. Everybody was invited to testify before our full committee. Everybody was invited to testify before our subcommittee. There's not an amendment that's before us that we haven't reviewed and worked on. That's what we're trying to say. Now, some people weren't successful. Now, the reasons they weren't successful is, one, there was a lot of jurisdictional issues. We represent the transportation system, but we do not represent railroads. And a lot of people want to do um, electric cars and the whole darn bit. Well, we're not into that business. That's what we're trying to say to you. And I don't think it's profitable for us to be touting amendments that are going to come to the floor, and I mean it with the greatest of respect to any member, that is deeply in somebody else's jurisdiction, and we get into the jurisdictional route, and we don't want somebody else's jurisdiction. That's where I'm coming from. Thank I think the rest much, of it's Chairman. there. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> there's a problem between 
the net figure and the gross figure. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that uh, I think Ways and Means figures $25 billion, your figure something like $33 billion. What the, what the debate focuses on is the following. I think both of my colleagues here have made the point. Our commitment to the people of this country in bringing this bill forward is based on the nickel for America. We tried every way we knew how, and it took us months in negotiations with the Budget Committee and everybody else to see if we could get part of the two and a half cents or the whole nickel that we voted on in the budget agreement last year assigned to the needs as we expressed here. There is no way that anybody would give, either the Congress or the White House, on that issue. So we had no other course to go after we exhausted that. What we did, we went, then went to work and figured out how could we raise these fundings and what would it achieve. And we, we, the, the presentation we've made to the Ways and Means Committee and now making to you folks today is based upon the point of view outside the budget caps, based upon the nickel, it's approximately $6.6 .6 billion a year, and it's pay as you go. On that basis, which we've been working all over the country, we say if it's pay as you go, the nickel has to be used now for the transportation system. We don't want it subsumed into the trust fund because that happened last year. Part of the debate comes back and says to us, well, you got a nickel last year, and now you're coming for another nickel. We didn't get a nickel last year. The nickel went in to uh, offset the budget deficit, the caps are sealed, the rest of the funding in there. So it was a hopeless task. Mm -hmm. We're looking for real funding to be able to get this job done. Chairman Yale on the point. Sure. Always in the past, Mr. Chairman, these trust funds have been used as gross receipts. So this would be an entirely new uh, concept if, if they took net receipts. And, and further, Mr. Chairman, if the new idea is to be adopted, that you take the nickel and subtract out of it 1.2 cents to go into the general fund because that's the loss in tax revenues as a result of businesses having to pay the tax. That's the ways and means to provide those. If, if you uh, adopt that, then you must take it a step further and do the other side of the ledger. And the other side of the ledger is if you have less taxes coming in because of what I've just described, then you must also calculate the additional taxes you have coming in as a result of the nickel. $5.5 billion in transportation construction translates into 243,000 new direct construction jobs, which at about $25,000 a job produces uh, uh, a couple of thousand, three thousand dollars a year in taxes per job, which translates into a million, a billion dollars a year additional coming into the trust fund just from the individual in the individuals who are employed, plus the increased profits that the construction companies are making as a result of building, are, they're going to pay taxes on that. So if you're going to, on the one hand, calculate the loss to the Treasury, you must also calculate the, the other side of the ledger, the new revenue to the Treasury, and it's a wash. Isn't there some fear, though, that if you're, when you're ending the program that you may have to go into the discretionary funds, into the appropriation? No. No, sir. That, that's not entered into it at all? Mr. Chairman. Have you heard that argument? Oh, yes. Oh. Now, I mentioned this. No, Th sir. Those figures came from the Joint Tax Committee, and we're not entirely sure that the Ways and Means Committee have really adopted that no. concept. The reason I raise these, because these are the arguments that I think that are going to determine the the fate of this bill, and I, sure. I would like exactly. to hear your side of it. That's the side of it. The idea on net gross, they simply can come back and say the following. We get the nickel in, in effect, it's, we're going to lose taxes at, at the, out of that, or, and so forth, they took a penny away. At least that's the perception. The paperwork hasn't been done yet, nor has the circles been closed on. What Bud is saying, well, hey, if you're going to take part of the, the tax loss away, because the per then the, other, the, the business people are going to be deducting the tax that we're adding on. Why isn't there any revenues on the other side? Of course there's revenues on the other side, but that's completely apparently not being considered, at least at the moment. Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I simply want to take a moment to congratulate the three gentlemen on their, on their statements, on their opening statements, and also on their testimony. And if I may say so, our own chairman's opening statement, too. I think all four of you have made a very compelling case for for this program and for, for this bill. It is an expensive program, and it does, obviously, therefore, elicit or excite a lot of opposition. Much of it, in my opinion, I'm thinking and a bit demagogic, to be quite frank about it. But I think the point that the chairman, Mr. Rowe, and others made, that it's, a, it's an investment program, is clearly correct. It's absolutely essential, whatever your arguments might be as to the exact parameters of it or how much money exactly there should be in it or 
perhaps how it should be funded. I personally am for an even higher gas tax for all kinds of reasons, and I think most of it should go to you all to, to provide this kind of, of infrastructure. But it's an obvious, quite obviously a program which is absolutely necessary for our country to remain competitive, for us to uh, keep our economy going and to grow in the proper way and to keep us as productive as we, as we need to be in, in this interdependent world that, that, we're, that we're in now. So in any case, I think it's clear uh, it's clear from the bipartisan support from your own committee and, and elsewhere that you've, you've done a very good, and not, not only that, a very, I think, careful and responsible job on this particular bill. I only want to say one other additional thing, if I may, and that is um, many of us, especially those of us from heavily impacted urban areas, appreciate very much the support you gave to mass transit, the $32 billion or whatever it is. Quite obviously, in a place like Southern California, and I'm sure in other urban areas around the, around the country, we need more of additional transit than we do of additional highways, and we appreciate enormously the amount that you've, that you've authorized and the flexibility you've given local authorities to go that route, because that, in my opinion, at least, is what we need, at least where I come from. So good luck with your bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate all of you at the table for testifying and using the charts. Very commendable, displaying accurately what you have in mind. You know, as I've said before, I cut my legislative teeth on the Public Works Committee, and I've seen the interstate system grow and grow and grow and expand, but now it's on the, kind of on the way out. It needs improving. We also all know that uh, there are more automobiles, more people, our population is increasing. The demand for better transportation facilities really is very real. And I commend you for the work that you've done in bringing forth a package that will do the job. Not halfway, but I feel like it will, as you have said, uh, keep the status quo and keep things going as they should be, not as much probably as we all would like to see, but pay as you go is an important item. And certainly a nickel invested in the future of America is not exorbitant at all. So I congratulate you. I do have a question. I wonder why we couldn't have brought the bill to the floor before the closing days of the session. I've heard some members say that they have obligations that might not be here, even tomorrow or over the weekend. It seems to me that it had been more appropriate had we uh, had the bill a little earlier on. Well, if the gentleman would yield on that, uh, this has been a humongous effort. The uh, staff and members have been working on this bill for the last seven weeks, seven days a week until four and five o'clock in the morning. That's how involved the bill is. If we were to give this bill the proper attention, which we did, and take into consideration the members' concerns and the, and the industry throughout the nation, and even screening everything the administration had sent to us, and so there's no way it could have been done faster and done properly. So we I know did the you best worked way. hard, and I know that you consider every aspect because that, that's the way you do your job, all, all of it. Uh, how long do you think this will take on the floor? Well, it depends upon what you, what you folks uh, give us as a rule, but... Um, if it's anything like our water resources bill, if we can satisfy all our members, I'd like to be done with it in an hour, but that's not going to be possible. I think it'll probably take three or four hours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let the record show the Honorable Norman Etter has joined us, the subcommittee chairman. May I interrupt? Mr. He worked very, very hard on this bill. So he was down on the floor being busy, but I want everybody in this room to know well, what a great job I he's done as chairman him. of that committee. Bill, I want to allow him to make his opening statement if he has one. Or I really don't have one, Mr. Chairman, just to thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here and be supportive of uh, Mr. Uh, Rowe, uh, Mr. Hammersmith, and Mr. Uh, Schuster. I think uh, the thing I would like to say is that it is a new approach in terms of surface transportation. It is not just a renewal of a five-year highway bill. We have rewritten surface transportation law and uh, I think uh, uh, tried to give it a new look in terms of being, uh, in terms of intermodalism, in terms of transferability, in terms of flexibility, in terms of looking at the needs and trying to face up to uh, a realistic program, pay-as-you-go finance mechanism, 
I think all the way around, everyone has worked hard to bring out a very good, realistic bill for us. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Frost of Texas. Chairman, um, first of all, I think that uh, you have done the right thing. I think that this is uh, legislation that is needed for the country. It is, as you know, it is not uniformly popular in my part of the country because people drive great distances and will be paying a very significant uh, portion of the gasoline tax. Has anything been done formally or informally to attempt to coordinate with states as they raise their gasoline taxes? Because uh, this is a concern specifically in my state. My legislature is considering raising the gasoline tax right now. And uh, has your committee at any point uh, tried to coordinate this in any way? Let me tell you, in the, in my, my, my comments aren't critical. In the administration's proposal, the basic thesis under the bill is that there should be more local participation. And if there's more local participation, we will get more done. On the other hand, in our testimony and the hearings we've held, we even as late as this afternoon, there are states that would have great difficulty in raising 50-50 match, 60-40 match. They wouldn't be able to move ahead at all. What we have done, we've, we've in sync pretty much with the Senate on that. We kept the 90-10 on the interstate. And then what we've done on all of the other program, we're, we're at 80-20. The reason we did that was to meet the kinds of needs you're talking about. Now, point number two, that a number of states call to our attention, not only do they contribute to their transportation um, program out of uh, gasoline taxes, but also other types of taxes in their respective states that may be some kind of property taxes or whatever. So, and also we've looked at the whole situation as far as gas hole is concerned. There's about seven or eight or nine states affected in that direction. What we're coming back and saying is that uh, even with what we're doing here now, in the quantitative funds that are going to have to be raised, if, if we, ha we think we've got the best foundation of the states to work from with the 8020s we're working on now, but they're going to have to be raising additional funds in their states to be able to accommodate the needs and the highway program that, and the transit program we put in there. If the chairman would yield, in sure. just the past couple of weeks, Texas has come to us and expressed some concerns. We have, number one, increased the minimum allocation formula. Mm -hmm. So Texas would get a better deal. And secondly, we very substantially increased the flexibility pot and put a 90% minimum allocation on that subpot as well, directly as a result of Texas coming to us and, and expressing their interest. So we, I believe we have very much accommodated uh, the great Lone Star State. Well, I understand that, and I, I appreciate all of that. Uh, my, my question really went to the level of gasoline taxes being imposed by both states and it, it, gasoline increases being imposed by both states and the federal government at the same time, and that uh, while we're raising the gasoline tax here in Nickel, uh, my state and other states are raising the gasoline tax um, for additional state revenue, and any attempt to coordinate that so that we don't have such a heavy burden on the consumer uh, all at the same time. Well, if I, if we're getting a little more time than I thought the chairman was going to let, let, let us have. Let me, let me say this. We've got people now that are complaining. <laughs> We've got people that are complaining, for example, from the AA. I'm not supposed to mention names because maybe that's, you know, well, I have to mention it. They're representing the, 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 the citizen driving on the roads and the citizen that's in the tourism of the country. We're saying to them, we don't understand your objection. You are the same people that come back to us and tell us the roads are all potholes. Half the bridges of the country are not safe. Many are closed down and so forth. And you're telling us not to invest in, in your transportation system. The freedom of the American people is their automobile and their transit system. That's how they get around. In Germany, they just raised the, the, the cost. And God, God bless you. That I would suggest that uh, in our own country, it come, I think it was $1.07 sticks in my mind. Uh, and and the, the European countries are up to three and three dollars and twenty-five cents and more in their in their cost against their, their their gasoline. The fact remains: when all is said and done, with the census just being taken and two hundred and fifty new million people or two hundred fifty million people in our country, how are we going to get to work? How are we going to have the adventure? How are we going to enjoy our tourism if we don't have the resources to do it? So we're saying to the American people: Can you invest? And we want to invest in nickel in America. Interesting point. Let me shut up for a minute. I never do. But in Japan, Japan has now committed $3.2 trillion 
$3.2 trillion to rebuild their infrastructure. Four or five major regional airports, new tunnels connecting the islands, and so forth and so on. And from every country that's invested in their infrastructure system has improved the economies of their country. Yes, yeah, so I'd be happy to yield. I know you guys know this, and most of us, I suppose, up here know it, but most Americans don't know it. The average gas tax per, you know, by state in the U.S., state plus federal, as you all well know, is 30 cents at the moment. The average tax per gallon in Western European nations and in Japan is $2.48. It's eight times more. I mean, nobody, nobody can say that we're paying too much. Everybody else pays more. Nobody can argue that that additional amount of tax, and it's a lot of, you know, it's many times what, what you're asking, many, many times what you're asking, keeps them from being productive or having economies which are going full scale, full blast. I mean, that argument cannot be made, in my opinion. And yes, of course you deserve your five cents. You should have a lot more than it. And Americans have got to start understanding that if they want this kind of system, as well as other kinds of programs, they've got to pay for it. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I have only one other brief question, and I will be brief. Uh, Chairman, there was earlier in the week uh, a jurisdictional issue between your committee and the Mr. Lehman's uh, subcommittee on transportation, uh, transportation appropriations. Has that been resolved? Is there going to be an agreed upon amendment? What, what's, what being advice can you give the committee? It's being worked point? on now. We don't, uh, it is not our desire nor our, our effort in any way to take away anybody's jurisdiction. God knows we have to fight enough to keep our own. That's number one. Number two, the members have said to us, and I think this is fair play to say here today, members have said to us, hey, look it, we go through the process and we're working with the authorizing committees and it's only fair that we get the, top of the proper type of consideration because we went through the process. We have a confrontation, everybody in this room knows it, you know, when there's something that's unauthorized in the appropriations bill that, you know, one can bring up the uh, point of order on that. Now this committee has worked arm and glove with the appropriations committees around here. Everything that we do, we do on a bipartisan basis and we work with the appropriations committee. Now a debate has arisen because we're saying, and this is what we wrote our bill around, that the nickel for America is mandated. We use the word mandate, otherwise there's no purpose of this exercise and must be expended in the transportation program. There appears to be a feeling on the word mandate we have our staffs all working this afternoon to try to resolve the difference between the two of us. And part of the proposal of the Appropriations Committee is, no, we will not mandate that. We'll use that as discretionary money. That's the five cents or whatever proportion. We'll use it as discretionary money and we'll let it go in that direction and we'll raise the budget cap to achieve that goal. We cannot live with that. That does not achieve what we're trying to do as far as saying to the Congress, however we resolve it, if we're going to ask the people for a nickel, then the nickel must be used in their transportation system, not used to shield the public debt, or not used for some other program. Otherwise, we would be a fraud. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm for your bill, intend to support your bill on the floor. Uh, I hope that you all can work out your problem with the Transportation uh, Appropriation Subcommittee, because that could cause problems for your bill. We reasonably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Dar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, want to join in extending congratulations to all the gentlemen. I should say I'm happy to see California representation now at the table. Very strongly represented. Very strongly represented, I know. Uh, but I want to extend to all of you sincere congratulations for your, uh, not only your testimony here, but your, the long hours that you have put into crafting what clearly is a very important item. And as you said in your uh, presentation with the chart here, Mr. Chairman, the President of the United States has established this as a priority. He said it in his address. Uh, uh, when he was talking about the uh, uh, Operation Desert Storm, and uh, I think that is something that I hope we can end up getting his support on. I have to say that as I heard you at the chart make the statement that you were hoping to bring the administration support, at that moment we were all handed a statement of administration policy, and I read the first paragraph here. It says, the administration supports improvements and reforms to the federal highway uh, transit, federal, federal aid highway transit and highway safety programs. Nevertheless, the President's senior advisors would recommend that he veto H.R. 2950 in its current form because of several significant problems, including, goes through this whole list, and the first one, reliance on an increase in the federal gas tax. And it seems to me that <clears throat> with that outline as a, a first point, I mean, that, that creates a great I, level of concern here. Yeah, that? J.P.? 
we're hoping that yeah. the president himself will wait until he sees the finished mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. If we get this bill through the floor, we go to conference, then he can review it and make a mm -hmm. judgment at that time. We're hoping that that's what yeah. will happen. Well, I, you know, I, I think that you, you clearly do make a, a compelling case, and my friend Mr. Bielensen has consistently made a very compelling case juxtaposing the American economy with that of others, which pay a much higher rate of gasoline tax. I don't happen to concur, and I think that as we look at um, our proposals for substitutes, I hope very much that we'll be able to to um, include the uh, substitute which Mr. Bennett and I are, are offering to this, and, and uh, I think that there are benefits which can be accrued all the way across the board. I think that also as we, as we look at this challenge, we have a case where just last night as we were debating this on the floor, I've got the record here, uh, the Majority Leader, Mr. Gephardt, said, we will insist that there be a procedure where if the gas tax comes out, then a commensurate number of programs need to come out. He said that last night on the floor, and that seems to me makes a, if, if we do in fact see a, cha a change, a modification of the gas tax, it seems to make a very compelling case for uh, the amendment that Mr. Bennett and I are going to be trying to offer here. They will? Well, we, we need to make an explanation that if they cut back, the bill oh, yeah, is crafted oh, yeah. to where you would have to pull the bill. Yeah, you you cannot that. cut back a commensurate amount on any Very any important amount. point. Now, if I can interrupt, or Norman can oh. explain better than I can. Let me, let me tell you something. We wrote this bill around that level of funding. The bill has been totally written that way. It is not the type of bill that you could, if you put the nickel in, you would take the nickel out. Not so. The bill and the formulas have all been laid out accordingly. The point being that you, if you tried to subsume or take a part of the money out, you would have shorted this account and so forth. The bill has to be totally rewritten. Well, the thing that, that concerns me, Mr. Chairman, is... Can I interrupt? It's, uh, yeah. it's the intention of the chair to, to continue the hearings through the vote, so I would hope m members would get down and vote. Supposed to so, Mr. Like Chairman, you're trying to cut me off right No, I'm not. Uh, not the idea here? I don't want you to... You may finish your question, then you can let them... Talk to the table. They won't be here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to continuing the question as we, uh, as we uh, go downstairs to cast our vote. But I, the only thing that I will say is that it seems to me that if we are going to bring about some kind of modification... I'm, I'm concerned with the proliferation of demonstration projects. I saw you on the NBC Nightly News make your case for Congress getting involved. But it seems to me that local control can't be completely thrown out the window. And if, if, you look at the, if you look at the increase, Mr. Chairman, in the number of demonstration projects, it has grown over the past several years. And I just wanted to say that that's something that concerns me. Well, I appreciate your concern, but there, there's one thing that I, I don't know how much time we got, but there's one thing that's... seven minutes, Mr. Chairman. There's one it thing It takes us 30 seconds to get downstairs. All right. So let me give you six minutes. The, there's one thing you have to Is look at. Is that net growth? The... Well, we know this will be a debate on the floor tomorrow, and, and, and let, me, let me say this, it's been a, a, a prominent point as far as the press is concerned. I don't know how you feel about it, but I've been here 23 years in this Congress. I we've been working on one road we've been trying to finish. It's taken them 14 years and you can't move anything. You know what I think the American people are saying? If we thought you could get something done, if you thought that you could achieve something, one intersection corrected in our lifetime, 12, 14, 15 years, you got to go through 17,000 hoops before you can put an HOV lane in. We're saying, does Congress have anything to say whatever about the transportation system? Do you think I would vote to give them $153 billion without having Congress say something? For God's sakes, they never were elected. It hasn't gone through the process. Whose process? Their process? They were the ones who wrote it. How about the state process? The states are absolutely frustrated because they can't get anything done. Mr. The Chairman, American people, Chairman I just want to finish. The American people will vote that nickel. You know what the, what the debate's going to be about tomorrow? Because it's the true thing. Once the middle class has something to say, and their members are required to take care of the needs of those states. That's well, what I'm coming to. Mr. Chairman, would you have anything said, to do ahead, with Norman. local control? Where is it going to be? I bet in most instances it's going to be found in the $6.8 billion of, quote, special projects put together by members because they have gotten it from their State Department's highway, they've gotten it from their county, they've gotten it from their cities, 
These members haven't just thought up these process, uh, programs on their own. They got them from somebody else. And so in, 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 lo in terms of local control, when you look at our bill, it is a local control bill. That's why we have flexibility in there. That's why th this is the new thrust of this bill, is because of that local control. States and localities, in effect, will be, in I, the final analysis, will be controlling 94% of the funds. Norman, I understand that that clearly is the case, but it seems to me that with the demonstration project program, which is increasing in size as it has through the decade of the 80s, we have gotten to a point where we are basically saying we're the ones who are going to ensure that that intersection is completed because they can't. We've only and I'm just very concerned about moving in that direction. Only, only in conjunction with the State Transportation <coughs> Department on that intersection. They, the states have to put up the matching Sit. funds, the 20 percent on those projects. None of them are 100 percent. In the $2 billion that's allocated for the new cars, I know we're going to miss a vote. We can continue no. discussing this right. as we walk down. Uh, so thank you very yeah, much. All right. I'll, would you please come right back, oh, yes. gentlemen? David, have you voted yet? No, I haven't. Why don't you vote? They'll, they'll come back. All right. All right. I, I, I guess I'll have to call a brief re recess. I thought I'd be able to go through here, but uh, so the committee will be in brief recess uh, subject to the return of the witnesses and the members. Uh, the committee will resume its hearing. Uh, David, will you finish your questioning? Actually, not completely, uh, Mr. I was Chair. Of that. Yeah, I know you suspected it, but you know what? You've got Bart over there who could uh, could handle it, but nobody else on your side to question. So I'll take a couple minutes until the is, rest of the. Did Alan morning. Weed have some questions? Ask Mr. Weed. I'll ask questions until they come back. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we can't wait that long. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me. Uh, let me just uh, proceed with a couple of things. First of all, I've got a, gotten a letter from uh, Norman from our uh, State Board of Equalization. And uh, in the end block amendments that you were talking about, Mr. Chairman, do you include in that the International Fuel Tax Agreement? Um, now, there's this letter that was sent actually to Don Edwards, and I got a copy of this. Voices real concern from the state of California about incorporation of that. And I just wondered, were you aware of their concern in California, Norman? or? Well, uh, the International Fuel Tax uh, Act is something that would be a concern to, to many states. And uh, what we have done is to incorporate in this uh, legislation with the IFTA a provision, uh, two other provisions as they relate to the, uh, I guess you might say, the deregulation of the trucking uh, uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, they come as a package in terms of the IRP and the bingo card and the IFTA. Yes, uh, some states are concerned about it. I was aware of the concerns of the state of California. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of public policy mm -hmm. from a national perspective, I think uh, this is a, uh, a piece that we took from uh, Congressman Hastert's bill, and I think it's the right way yeah. to go. I just, uh, you know, I was just concerned because here, you know, you and I have an obligation to represent the concerns of our states here, and, and that's why it, it came to my attention. And when I heard that, that it was part of the end block package that you'd outlined, Mr. Chairman, I... It's, uh, I think in the balance, you look at it in terms of, of our interests uh, from a state perspective, uh, in terms of the perspectives of a short term versus long term, mm -hmm. and in terms of a national concern, I felt that the national public policy concerns outweighed uh, the state. Let me, let, me a, let me add a codicil to what Norman's saying. I think he's absolutely right, because in the one issue where we eliminated what is referred to as the bingo cards, where the different trucking uh, organizations have to ha get a stamp from every state going throughout the country, we had letters and, and communications and debate on that. The country can save about 340 to $350 million a year. The revenue coming into the states is approximately 50. We gave them two years to adjust, and we gave we, we provided 50 million dollars for them to adjust to that. So the question is, in public policy, if we invest 50 million dollars and we can save 350 to 400 million dollars mm -hmm. a year, is that not a good thing to well, do? Clear, clearly, we're for that. The, the the one sort of procedural question that I would ask, as far as it relates here, this letter I said was sent to our California colleague Don Edwards on the Judiciary Committee. Do you know if the Judiciary Committee was at, at all involved in, in this uh, decision to proceed with this? Because, I mean, I don't know. You, you said you were aware of it, and 
But we didn't. And copies of it were sent to, to Jack Brooks, Chairman Moakley, to uh, Tony Bielenson and me. No. So, so the, the Judiciary Committee is not involved in this, no. but the, do you think we, they we should? We did not involve the Judiciary Committee. Do you think they should have any jurisdiction at all over this uh, whole proposal? Doesn't the say IFTA? they don't have jurisdiction. The point of was the transportation On the IFTA? trucking hub. We have that basic fundamental yeah. jurisdiction. And the only other thing that I would say, now Norman, you, you indicated when I was raising questions about demonstration projects that state and local governments clearly have approved and support these. Are there any cases at all where state and local governments have not been supportive of demonstration projects? Have not? Mm -hmm. I, I would think not, uh, really? because again, uh, you know, these these um, <coughs> programs uh, uh, come from the states, yeah. they come from the cities, they come from the counties. Uh, so it, in many instances, these are, as the chairman had indicated earlier, been on the books in terms yeah. of some plan mm -hmm. for 10, 12, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Well, you, uh, you say in many instances, I'm just, I'm just concerned because I understand that Mr. Bennett, with whom I'm offering this amendment, has a number of cases of demonstration projects, which he'll be talking about when he uh, steps up here today, uh, which have not been approved by the states and the, and, uh, the local government. I, was, I wasn't wrapping oh. for you, David. Okay. May I just ask one more question, Mr. Sure. Chairman? Uh, the, the other thing that concerned me as I look at the... Um, as I look at the different percentages here, is it seems to me that, that some states have zero. No. And, zero what? I'm sorry. Zero oh. projects? Yeah, demonstrate. No. Alaska? No, one of the issues of the general deal, one of the issues that we came up with, and that was the final decision was made between sub and full committee, that the we have provided a full 90% return to every state mm -hmm. in the formula in that particular area. If, a, if, a, if there's not a demonstration project that happens to be in the bill, funds have been allocated that state out of the proportionate share they're entitled to out of all funds in the bill. Mm -hmm. So there are some states that, that have open monies that would go to the states. Well, so even if they don't have a demonstration a specific project, special yeah. project in this bill, they still get mm -hmm. a... 90 percent of that share of that, fun, that funding. Well, the, thing that, the thing that concerns me is I just looked down this, I'm sure you all have seen this, list yes. here which has the the percentages and the numbers of, of projects and in it I, I see this great level for like the state of Pennsylvania 14.79 percent 970,070 and I look at, at then again as I said Alaska and uh, I think Connecticut or Colorado and it seems that that maybe they were online really pursuing this very diligently before and it, and there's a lot to be made up for Pennsylvania and some of the others which have really had a shortfall. The gentleman would yield on that point. <clears throat> the final discussion in the fast with the fast formula group was based upon a, the point of view that when we developed the formulas that the formulas did not cover the special project category. Mm -hmm. And they said that was not fair and there was an equity, an equity point involved and that should be included. We re-reviewed the formulas and we included that. So that where states are getting demonstration projects, they have to absorb them into the funding that's been allocated under that section for them. So that if any state, whatever that allocation has been allocated to the state, if there's a special project in there, it is absorbed within that funding. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Massachusetts. Well, I, I, did, I wasn't looking Stay at Massachusetts. The what is Massachusetts, Mr. Chairman? It's in the minus column. The minus column. <laughs> <You're, laughs> I was here any? trying to make the case, uh, Chairman Rowe, for Massachusetts, and that really is the example I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gordon, do you have any questions? I just want to thank the uh, panel for a good presentation and for a good bipartisan, bipartisan proposal that you brought up. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Chairman, I would join my colleagues in expressing our appreciation to the Big Four. It's traditional on occasions like this to say that uh, someone worked very hard on a piece of legislation, but in this case, it actually literally was physical labor. Hour after hour, Bob Rowe is a, quite a taskmaster, <coughs> makes people uh, work on Saturdays and Sundays and, and, and nighttime, and uh, as a result, uh, the staff and everyone involved has been able to make a tremendous revision that was necessary for the infrastructure. I commend uh, Chairman Mineta as well as the ranking members 
A couple of things that have us concerned, of course, and I think depend on whether or not this legislation will pass this week, has to do with this idea that the Ways and Means Committee has come up with in recent years that they have access to the trust funds that are paid for by the highway users, put into a barrel for highway repair and maintenance, and that the Ways and Means can use it for other purposes. Last fall, they took two and a half cents for, quote, debt reduction, unquote, and many of us protested, the, the Public Works Committee unanimously protested, that this was a firewall that was being breached, it was not in the best interest of America, and that once the Ways and Means Committee found fresh meat in the trust fund that they could use for their own purposes, that they'd be back again. And they went to great lengths to pound the table and scream in the microphone and explain the crisis that America faced, and this was unique. That this was a time in which the summiteers had come together, in which the President of the United States and the leadership in the House and Senate had come to a very special time and a very unique purpose, and this would never, ever happen again. And they left off a little phrase, until next time. And now here we are, <clears throat> immediately at the very first piece of legislation coming out of the 102nd Congress, in which the Ways and Means Committee is back again, saying that we want to take a certain percentage of the highway gas tax uh, for other purposes, to offset something or whatever goal they might have. Uh, subsequently, Mr. Chairman, I have two amendments. Number one is to say that these trust funds would be w without the reach of the Appropriations and Ways and Means Committee, that they would be taken off budget for the purpose for which they were established in trust. Uh, secondly, I have one that would, would not extend the 2.5 percent gas tax that was established in the budget compromise of last fall and would be allowed to expire and would not, as recommended by the Ways and Means Committee this year, continue on for another three years, which in, which in actuality is in perpetuity. Uh, I would like to ask your advice on those two amendments and how, uh, how you see them and uh, any direction you might have. Well, if I can respond to the distinguished gentleman, from our point of view, when we go to the American people and we're saying to them they're paying a nickel in trust for the transportation system that it ought to be respected by the Congress of the United States, <coughs> in my opinion, I think the second point is that uh, we have, uh, this as a committee, vigorously opposed uh, from time infinitum uh, any diversion of that uh, uh, funding for any other purposes. Um, it's interesting, if the tax is supposed to be retro, uh, regressive, which some people have now come, that's the usual old saw that comes up when we have a debate, uh, but yet they're willing to subsume that, that money into, uh, into the general fund. So we, we, we certainly would support and will continue to support the trust in the trust fund. That's what we're saying. And I think the people support that point of view. Um, Anyway, that's right, Jim. And, and if, if, if the Rules Committee, the only way that this happened was last fall, the Rules Committee made a special waiver that gave permission for, for that diversion to be made. Uh, if the Rules Committee made it in order to consider taking those trust funds off budget, you would not oppose that and thereby protect those highway trust funds only for highway purposes. If the distinguished gentleman has a little bit of humor left in his busy world, as I'm wondering whether I do, it would be a little less profitable to have to debate that issue because we have debated it ten times. But if you thought in your wisdom it was the right thing to do, then you have to make that decision. Well, would my colleague uh, yield uh, also on this uh, whole issue of the net revenue, gross revenue? Again, uh, uh, it seems to me if they are going to be deducting because of the increased deductions that are eligible because of the increase in gasoline taxes, seems to me that we ought to be considering the other side, as has already been mentioned, and that is Revenue. the fact that we are spending $153.5 billion in the next five years. That means over two million jobs. That's got to mean some net income into the, into the Treasury. So if they're going to deduct for increased deductions because of an increase in the gasoline tax, it seems to me they ought to also give us credit for the increase because of the jobs that are created and, and, and uh, uh, but, you know, in this instance, uh, we, you've heard of one-handed, uh, one-armed uh, economists. In this uh, instance, we have one-eyed, one-eyed uh, 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 number crunchers who are only looking at the debit side and not the credit side, and I haven't seen any good economists or CPAs 
uh, really who are th with that kind of a head in the sand approach, but it's unfortunate that they are not willing to take a look at the credit side in terms of what gets generated, and, and I recognize that that's what you're driving at, and I appreciate that point. Well, I would say, Mr. Mineta, it, it's almost bizarre to say that there's going to be a deduction on a tax that hadn't been raised yet, and therefore we have to take some of it because there's going to be a deduction tax that hadn't been raised. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's matched it, only by this idea. That is, that the money that's in the trust fund presently, the $24 billion, that if we spend it down because it's already there, that we have to increase taxes because we're increasing spending, which is also a ways and means position. Now, I don't know how those folks function down there, but the idea, uh, both of these are just absolutely appalling, they, and infrastructure suffers as a result. If they wanted to put the whole nickel into the highway trust fund and then do the scorekeeping, I could understand that. But in this instance, they're taking the gross revenues from a five-cent gasoline tax and diverting 25 percent, as you've indicated, to the general fund, and the other 75 percent then into the trust fund. And that, to me, is just outrageous. Well, let's conclude one thing on the demonstration projects. Demonstration projects, when they were in invented some 20 years ago, basically were 100 percent projects, were they not? Yes. A and so therefore, under this bill, there are no such projects. No, they're all therefore, maps, maps. The frustration that many people experience about demonstration projects where the federal government comes in and does something that nobody wanted is an impossibility because it requires the same match as it does every other Exactly. The states have to put a their proportionate share. The gentleman need one more point. It's interesting to note that in our good work with the Appropriations Committee this year, there was uh, I don't know, 67 uh, demonstration projects, for want of a better phraseology, in that legislation. There were a couple of dozen projects in the in the transit side of the bill. So I, I don't think we've invented anything new as far as the Congress. Also, if the gentleman would yield, uh, in terms of the special projects, in the past, when you're, when you're computing minimum allocation, the state would get penalized because they would take the special projects from the previous year, subtract it from what you would be getting under the minimum allocation, minimum allocation. for this year and states would always get penalized. In this instance, under this new bill, yeah. we eliminate that practice, and we don't penalize the states for the number of, of uh, special projects that, are, that they get, and they are protected for their full 90% under the minimum allocation program. Thank you. Thank you. Slotta, do you have any questions for the panel? No, I just want to congratulate both of them for their good work. Let me make a statement. I don't really have a question because it isn't anything we haven't heard from you before. New York is in terrible shape, and over half of our bridges are substandard, and our roads are falling apart, and we are desperate. Um, I know how hard you tried to break the trust funds, and it's a serious problem for me to go back home and say to New Yorkers who have just had an uh, increase in gas tax and state level, um, that we've got to have another nickel for America because they, they know that that money is already in that trust fund. And I, I just want to go on record as saying that I certainly do believe that as long as we've got that surplus money sitting in that trust fund, mm -hmm. a continual other nickel for America, uh, we might as well level with them and say the money's there, but we're not ever going to spend it. Well, uh, can I respond to that? Absolutely. Sure. I know. Well, let me say this to you. You know, we all know here, every member of this Congress knows that there was a budget agreement made, right. whether we voted for it or not, they know that. And we know that that nickel did not go for transportation, went for debt reduction, went, let me respond, I just right. want to make sure. this point. And we're coming back and saying, if it is the will of the Congress that they don't want to provide any resources to go back and to, to rebuild the transportation system, then Congress has to speak to it. What is the use of kidding the American people? Just let me finish this one point. Right. My enthusiasm, forgive me. Two months ago, the, the uh, OPEC nations met, two months ago, and they had a summit meeting and they were determining what they would do with their basic costs after Desert Storm was over. And the decision they came to, at that time, gasol the gasoline spot price was, nine, uh, oil spot price per barrel was 19 plus dollars per barrel. They made a decision. It was in all the press. It's been in every magazine throughout the country. They were going to create a market situation where they were going to raise the price from $19 a barrel, I'm going to say this on the floor tomorrow when we're there, to 23 That is nothing I invented. It is there. They have done it. So they are going to set an international market price, which we're captive to, 
and they're going to raise it up to $23 a barrel. It would make a, a, a translated difference of about 25 or 30 cent uh, increased cost of a gallon of gasoline in the United States. But what are they going to do with the 30 cents? Rebuild you know what Kuwait. They say? They're going to rebuild Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting here like a bunch of idiots coming back and saying we can't afford to spend a nickel to rebuild our own country. Now something's got to be wrong with that. Oh, I, I don't want you to think that's what I'm saying, Mr. Rowe. No, no, no. I'm not Quite saying that. Yet, I, I think that we, we spent the no, when Nickel, we talked about last year to rebuild America. I just know that New Yorkers pay in a tremendous amount of money into all these trust funds. And I'm yes. sorry, I, I try not to get into this, but does, didn't this make the case for more conservation? Sure. And shouldn't you know, and so, I mean, most of the countries that have these high gas tax that you're talking sure. about, you know, it's conservation, I mean, it doesn't all go to their roads. Sure. It, it's for conservation. Agreed. And if this, if we are talking about national security, Yes, sir. Then we do need to talk about conservation, whether it's higher gas prices, Positive. certainly, you know, more efficient roads, uh, uh, tax credits for conservation. Positive. You know, it's got to be a part of it. And when we ought not just pass this by and not realize that this is a national security matter. And I'm sorry to totally agree with you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Frost. I'll be very brief, and it may be that this was adequately covered and I just I, I didn't hear it but mr. chairman if we wanted to make sure that of the uh, this new five cents the not the five cents from last year but the new five cents if we wanted to make sure that all five cents of that rather than 75 percent of it went into the trust fund and was used for rebuilding roads and bridges how do we do that and do we have to make an amendment in order to the bill to do that well, uh, and we're up to up front with you. The speaker is waiting up for us now because there's negotiations going on with ways and means to determine how we solve the problem. We're not sure ourselves, so we, I would like to, to be able to close that circle before we make any observation. The only observation we can make, and the chairman will excuse me just quickly, we have said to the people of this country, and we've said it to the Congress, we wrote this into the bill, we have said that in view of all the things we've done to try to get under that budget cap, we can't do it. And we're saying that if we're going to charge the people a nickel, which is going to produce $6.6 .6 billion a year, then it should be pay-as-you-go, and it must be indelibly clear. It can only be used for that purpose, and it must be expended. That's all we've said. Now, we're trying to figure a way to get that done. If it is in someone's wisdom around here to determine we can't do that, then we probably will be coming back here tomorrow and withdrawing our request for a rule because that is what the substance of the bill is placed in. Mr. Chairman, I think you are taking exactly the right position because I believe if you fail on that matter that you will not be able to pass your bill on the floor. If we fail on that matter, we would have not told the people of the country the truth, and I will be part of that. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Solomon. before he leaves, and just in asking unanimous consent to submit the administration's position on the bill. And Without uh, objection. Uh, let me just say that uh, the administration says that they, in its current form, because of several significant problems, they will veto the bill. And I just point out that, uh, again, if Mr. Michael's amendment were allowed, uh, or Mr. Bennett, Mr. Dreyer's amendment were allowed, that would go a long way towards guaranteeing that we were going to get a bill that would be signed into law, and we would get done a lot of what you people have worked so hard to accomplish. So I, I would just point that out and ask the unanimous consent to submit this to the Without objection. I thank you very much for uh, thank you very much. a very uh, good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, the Honorable Gus Savage of Illinois. Will those people leaving please do so uh, as quietly as possible? We have other witnesses to testify. Mr. Chairman, nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, uh, I have a rather a small amendment that I want to uh, get permission for consideration uh, tomorrow or whenever. Uh, it's a supplemental a bit uh, to the um, amendment. You know the amendment where you, where you seek that uh, Mr. Minetta is going to uh, propose the, the dual goal in the uh, uh, set aside in the uh, uh, Surface Transportation Act, the, the 10 and 5. Uh, uh, well, 
Is it 10 and 5 or 10 and 3 and a half? 10 and 5 is what's right. what being proposed. That were two, but the, the, the one that settled on it was a 10 and 5. The reason is, if I just may take a moment in case sure. you can understand this, is that uh, 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 in the previous legislation, not the existing bill, not the one that be, that's being proposed, but in the pre previous legislation, it was 10 percent for minorities and administratively, uh, Secretary of Trans uh, Transportation Elizabeth Dole uh, added 3.2 for women. So the combined was 13.2. Uh, right. And in 87, it was collapsed by this saying that the women would be considered as disadvantaged for the purposes of the bill. It collapsed the 3.2 into the 10 and combined the dual goals into one. Uh, so that it was an effort to go back to the uh, uh, original way because the change was devastating, as I'll indicate in a moment. Uh, but when it got ready to go back to 10 and 3.2, it was discovered from Department of Transportation figures that at this point, women are participating at a rate of 5%. So that would have the effect you see of reducing I the women. See. So for that reason, Mr. Manetta is going to propose going back to 10% for minorities, but 5% for women. Uh, and if I may, uh, we had circulated to you a report from the uh, uh, Department of Transportation. And there's one sentence I just want to bring to your attention where it points out that between 1987 and 1990, the disadvantaged enterprise program has seen a 75 percent increase in reported women business enterprise participation, but a 32 percent decrease in minority business enterprise participation. And that's what the 10 and 5 and the dual is about. What, I'm, what I want to propose, however, is a bit more. As chairman of the Public uh, Building Subcommittee of the Public Works Committee, I've had an occasion to visit some construction sites to look at some of the problems that are occurring, and I give one example. In Oakland, for instance, Oakland, California, uh, uh, there's $171 million uh, federal building uh, going up. Uh, the developer had a 22 percent goal of subcontracts for disadvantaged businesses. Uh, uh, and he had exceeded that goal of 20 percent. It was up to 22 percent. But uh, uh, African-American-owned businesses had received only 3 percent of that, even though African-Americans constitute almost 60 percent of the population of, of Oakland and Richmond also. The reason for that is that uh, it is easier to do business with the least disadvantage, which is why, you, of course, you have uh, set aside and affirmative action programs, so that where you have that category, in this case, disadvantaged businesses, that may include four or five different groups, the, the one of those groups that is least disadvantaged will get most of the help and on down the line, just in, in the reverse order of the intention of affirmative action. The intention of affirmative action is to help those who are most disadvantaged. Well, we checked around the country, and the figures show, and this report from the Department of Transportation that we uh, submitted to you shows that clearly over the past five years, that, that when you have four or five groups in a category of disadvantaged business enterprises, the ones that are least disadvantaged in that category will receive the most and on down the line, which is another way of saying that the ones who are most disadvantaged <laughs> receive almost nothing. So to correct that error, we don't deal with the goals and the, and the dual goals and all that kind of business. It's just a small thing. We recognize that the most disadvantaged of these businesses need some extra assistance, not in terms of goals and that business, just assistance. Sometimes the state may decide you need to give them some assistance in bonding waivers or whatever the thing, but they need to give them assistance. Maybe it's an insurance coverage and so forth. But it's up to the state to do that because it varies in states. That's why, for instance, in the transportation bill, some states have complained that they couldn't reach 10 percent or whatever because there was not that sufficient minority in the state. Well, what this proposal to do is simple. It says, within this category of disadvantaged businesses, where you have especially disadvantaged businesses, it defines them, not by race, sex, or, or national origin, but it says by the degree of disadvantage, it says that where you have a group that has, in that state, and each state's different, that has 
that's suffering unemployment for the past five years, 50% higher than the unemployment rate for the state. 50% higher. Steadily over the last five years. And the median family income, 20% or more less than the state. That in a case like that, that the state must have a program to provide special assistance to that especially disadvantaged group to help bring it up along with the others. That's all. Now, you see, in a state like, uh, 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 well, Dakotas or, or Wyoming, that group wouldn't be African American. It wouldn't be Hispanic American. It would be Native American. Or in a state like Illinois, where we had the Dan Ryan uh, uh, Expressway repair problem a couple years ago with all the demonstrations and so forth, which reflected the same problem that I found in Oakland, there it would be African American. In uh, New Mexico, it would probably be Hispanic American. You see, so each state would differ, and it would not even affect all states because some states may not have that situation at all. But in those states where within the category of disadvantaged businesses, you find some that are pretty hardcore, especially disadvantaged, and as a consequence gets the least, that the state would have to provide some assistance program, not monetary assistance, assistance in all kinds of ways, depending upon what the problem was in that particular state to bring that business up. So it's just a supplemental uh, measure to help improve the overall concept of affirmative action. Uh, Mr. Chairman, did you speak to uh, Mr. Rowe on this amendment? Yes, what we did, no, well, yes, let me say, well, let me put it this way. Here's what happened with the amendment. We proposed it in committee, but the subcommittee chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Manetta, uh, 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 raised the question at the time that the language of it uh, might risk or uh, subject the amendment causing there to be a sequential referral. And the effect of that, of course, at this late date would have been to hold up the whole measure. Uh, but in doing so, he pointed out that he had no objection to the substance right. of the measure. It was this danger. And advised, and he took his advice, that we go to the uh, legislative uh, uh, council and so forth and, and, and work it out where the language would be so changed that it would not carry the risk of sequential referral. That was the only question. And we have done that. And so the reason we are raising it here to go to the floor rather than the committee is only for that reason. And that's the only reason that it wasn't part of the bill because of the threat of sequential referral? Well, let me just make clear, that's my opinion. It never got to the point of a vote because, I mean, never got to the point because we didn't, we, the language was the problem. But all I'm saying is that uh, on the advice at the committee hearing of going to the language straightened out, we did so. And there's no longer danger of sequential referral. All right. Derek, any questions? I have no questions. Mr. Solomon? No questions. Mr. Billinson? Yes. Mr. Quillen? No questions. Any questions? Mr. Weed? Mr. Chairman, I know that uh, Chairman Savage has done a great deal of work on this legislation and on this particular amendment. I know that there was some question about the amendment at the committee level in terms of That's language, right. but right. you've checked with legislative you've research and the parliamentarian has cleared it. That's right. Uh, then I would expect that it would be in good shape and ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. McHugh, any questions? Mr. Gordon. Yes, uh, because you've done a good job of pointing out the merits of the set-asides. Um, one thing I, you might address, I've had um, whether complaints or, or concern in my state that oftentimes uh, there are sham operations that are set up just to take advantage of the set aside. I guess my question is, uh, do you find that very widespread? And the second question is, uh, do you have any suggestions as to how that might be rectified so that those set asides can actually go for their original purpose and not be, you know, and not be uh, siphoned off through shams? Let me say two things, if I may. Uh, 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 the subject was not dealt with in the amendments of, of that are before us now. Uh, uh, because often the problem is administrative and is not peculiar uh, to the set-aside program. And, and uh, uh, in the Small Business uh, Act, the, 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 the uh, uh, reauthorization last year, the 8A reform, I happen to be a member of the Small Business Committee also, <laughs> And in the 8A reform last year, we, we greatly strengthened provisions to deal with the fraud. And it has not yet uh, been in existence long enough to have a good track record as to what was the result. But we dealt very strongly with that problem. 
But let me just also add, probably not to the all concerned. You said with that problem, that problem with the small business set aside. Yeah, you see the problem. Yeah, the, the small business act, which is the overall uh, program, uh, had was reformed two years ago in legislation, and and dealt with this problem of of, of fraud and did so very severely, but I'm saying that's only a couple of years ago, so we need a few more years to see how well that's going, and if we still see problems, we'll deal with it further. But that's done by the Small Business Act itself, and we did that. But let me add this, let me just make this point. Because some people, there's one thing, see, if you are concerned about the taxpayers' dollars and so forth, as we all would be, and, and, and we want legislation improved, as we are trying to do in the Small Business Act, but there are some who just oppose the concept, some, I don't mean members here, and, and, and use, the, will go and find examples of fraud, however and adultery, to try to use as an argument to bring out a program that they want to bring down, but they feel that their real argument won't carry water. And my answer to those would be, the greatest fraud that we have found has not been in any program such as the little, uh, 8 a program, the little set aside, but within the savings and loans industry. But no one suggests that we therefore close down all savings and loans and do away with the program. You correct the, the fault, the guilty, and punish the guilty, but don't let that have any bearing on the substance of the program itself. Well, I, I'm trying to bring up in a constructive way. I mean, if why not put an end to the naysayers, uh, if you can, uh, by correcting some of the fraud. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether people in my state are telling me the truth or not. I mean, I, I'm sure they, they're perceiving it as truthful. I don't know how widespread it is, but I mean, it's only, uh, it's only to the detriment of, of the set aside various groups, the disadvantaged groups, if the programs aren't being implemented well. So I'm not trying to say this is an excuse not to use it. I'm trying to say, let's try to maximize it. No, it's not, it's not true. My answer to what you raised was, as I said, is that it's done through the Small Business Act, where the 8A program is. Yeah. Are, are you saying that in, a, in, a, in effect that the Small Business Act, which has some very strong safeguards against the kind of sham operations that have been referred yes. to that have, in fact, been seen around the country, yes. also apply to the set-aside programs that we're referring to oh, here? absolutely. It applies okay. to all of them. That's oh, what okay. I was saying. You okay. don't do I it. I thought you were just saying that they and it was done, And it was done in the reform a couple of years ago. Okay. And I was saying after, you know, some years of experience, if we find that that's not altogether sufficient, then we'll certainly revisit it. But that's in small business. Okay. I, I, Under I, which the whole program, I mean, all the programs go. The definition of, of you know, disadvantage and everything. I, I understand that. Oh, okay. What do you stand here? Small, here to no. Like small business. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Savage. Thank you. For your excellent testimony. The committee will now be delighted to hear from Mr. Thomas Petri. You come up. Uh, is there anyone on the same subject or amendment that you would like to have come with you? Here to support uh, an amendment uh, that my a uh, colleague from Madison, Wisconsin, Scott Klug, seeks to offer on the, the, uh, to the bill on the subject of mandatory helmet laws. Uh, the bill, as it c comes out of the committee, is a wonderful bill, by the way, I think. I served on the committee, worked with it. I think the chairman, the ranking Republican on both the committee and subcommittee did a very good job, and on balance, the bill is well worth supporting as it came out of the committee. But one subject we debated in committee and voted on, we, I happen to be on the losing side, but it is an important, I think, uh, symbolic issue and a real issue to many people, is whether the federal government should override states in effect by requiring states to mandate that people must wear helmets on their uh, uh, heads, uh, regardless of whether they want to or not, or they feel it's safe for them under the circumstances or not, or there's, uh, if a state does not do that, it will lose uh, some revenue. Now, my state of Wisconsin did have a mandatory helmet law. Uh, we repealed it, and our fatalities went down significantly because we replaced it with an education approach. And in fact, according to our figures, there are four states in the United States that have no helmet laws. Their average fatalities per 100 accidents is 2.67. 23 states that have a full helmet law, their fatalities are 3.03 per 100. 
So if people are starting to talk about the consciousness and having blood on your hands, it may be that passing a helmet law that requires someone to, regardless of their own judgment about their own head, to wear a helmet on their law under all circumstances is causing deaths, not saving deaths. That's what the figures actually show if you're willing to uh, look at them. So I urge you to uh, at least give people a chance to uh, debate this issue. Uh, there is a great deal of public uh, interest in it on the part of uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are active, uh, uh, most directly affected, the people who do ride uh, uh, motorcycles. The bill is not well written. Their definition of a motorcycle in this bill is any motored vehicle of uh, three wheels or less. So you could in, uh, actually require uh, senior citizens who are riding three-wheeled vehicles to put on a helmet uh, technically. They go from down to the grocery store at their senior in Sun Valley and so on and so forth. Uh, at least uh, they ought to uh, clean the bill up somewhere uh, through the process, and they ought to allow states that do have uh, strict uh, uh, active education programs to continue with them rather than requiring them to uh, mandate helmets, uh, whether it makes sense under the circumstances or not. The figures don't support this uh, having saved lives. The figures, in fact, uh, uh, demonstrate just the opposite, that states that have an education program do better than states that have a mandatory helmet. Uh, Mr. Petra makes a good case, obviously, in terms of the safety issue. Let me say that this bill we think is a good compromise because it still mandates a number of safety protections involved in it. The amendment would require, for instance, anyone under 21 years of age on a motorcycle, whether an operator or a passenger, to wear a motorcycle helmet. It would require any motorcycle operator who's been riding for less than two years, regardless of age, to wear a helmet. It would also require any motorcycle passenger, regardless of their age, to wear a helmet if the person driving the motorcycle had also been driving the bike less than two years. As Congressman Petri indicated to you, we've got some great concerns about the proper reading of this legislation, and it may not only include senior citizens, as he referred to, but also conceivably people who ride snowmobiles, which is a big recreational sport in my neck of the woods, could conceivably even apply to people riding three-wheel golf carts as they make their way from the clubhouse across a road onto the tenth hole of a golf course. And for the members who are from down south and serious golfers rather than snowmobiles, I'm sure a number of your constituents would be very concerned. Now, I philosophically have a great problem with the argument that uh, we should be making the decision in Washington rather than states making decisions about motorcycle helmets. We've in the past used the threat of a loss of federal funds uh, to uh, beat states down when it came to the issue of drinking age, when it came to the issue of speed limit laws, when it came to seatbelt laws and now motorcycle helmet laws, and I think that's the reasons we have state capitals rather than having everything decided here in Washington. Wisconsin used to have a mandatory helmet law. It was repealed, and statistically, uh, all the evidence suggests that since we put a safety program in place, the fatality rate and the rate of serious injuries has, in fact, declined. And this bill would uh, encourage states to set up safety programs rather than a firm law itself. As a matter of fact, it will require 26 states to upgrade their helmet laws to include novice riders, would require 10 states to implement rider education programs. So I think we accomplish what the authors of the language that's in the highway bill right now do, which is to make motorcycle riding and other sports safer, but at the same time, we give states some flexibility. Thank you. I only wanted to say that when, when I drove around Lincoln Memorial this morning and stopped at that traffic light there, Mr. Petri was parked, was parked right next to me, but he was, <laughs> but he was in a car, so it was all right. But it's kind of really sweet little smile on his face, and I figured you were probably thinking about that very nice article that Peter Passel wrote oh. for you about you yesterday in the New York Times in Section 4. That was really nice. I don't quite understand that proposal myself, but it's a better one I thought than this, nonetheless. To share both your views completely, we've had similar experiences in New York, and uh, for years when I was in the New York State Legislature, we tried to uh, accomplish something similar. Uh, even to the point where uh, New York's uh, uh, poli uh, police uh, agencies uh, who rode motorcycles were opposed to uh, mandatory uh, helmet laws because it, uh, it, it actually caused accidents and it caused a few lives at one time. And, uh, and thirdly, philosophically, it is a state's rights issue. We should not be getting involved in it. We have enough to do. So uh, we'll certainly do everything we can to help. how much time it takes you, but it is an issue people would like to be on record on, and we That's do right. think it's important as it goes forward not to just be swept aside. And people think that 
We're not even taking their consideration. Appreciate your coming. Mr. Frost. I have no questions. Yes, Tom Scott. Uh, was this, was your amendment introduced at the committee level? Similar amendment was introduced by your colleague, Mr. Applegate. From, uh, now, was that the subcommittee or the committee level? That was in the subcommittee. Okay, so did, was anything introduced at this at the committee level? No. It wasn't. Uh, and so from what I understand, from the way you're discussing this, then uh, the statistics indicate that it's safer uh, to not wear a helmet. Is right. that correct? That's, those are our statistics from our state okay. uh, Department of uh, Transportation. Mm -hmm. So if it's safer not to wear a helmet, then, then um, w wouldn't it be appropriate uh, to... It's safer not to be required to wear a helmet under all circumstances. Uh, in our state, we do not have a requirement that people wear a helmet, but they in fact do wear them about 55% of the time, according to our motor vehicle car, where they feel using their head that it's safer for them to do it. Now you're going to require people as a matter of uh, national law to wear a helmet regardless of whether you know, substitute your judgment for their judgment under all circumstances. And in fact, it may be in some circumstances endangering people's lives as well. Well, now, aren't you, uh, with your legislation, you're also mandating on the state no. that, 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 that they have these different programs, aren't oh, you? Oh, that they educate people about Right, so you're, but you're mandating it. So why, why is your mandate less atrocious than, than another mandate? I mean, I, if your argument is that we ought to be mandating on the state, you're still doing that. <laughs> now he looks at me. Uh, I, I think what it does is, uh, if you come up with a compromise, we all realize that motorcycle riders are vulnerable in some way. And, but what, if you look at the statistics involved in accidents, what you find are most of the accidents tend to happen with inexperienced riders, and we're recognizing that. But still, um, after uh, an initial driver education program and after an initial period, people are given the option at 21 um, or not to wear helmets. And if, if your argument is that um, you'd oppose it, then I think the decision again should be made at a state capital level rather than at a federal level. Okay, but I, I see I, what I'm having trouble is your argument is one of you are, we've got to determine, I'd like to determine whether or not you're going to use the argument that we ought not be having, that we should not be for this. Uh, or we should we should support your amendment because we don't want federal mandates. So now is, is that one of your arguments or not? It's part of it, yes. Okay, so then if that's one of your arguments, how can you make that argument yet still make mandates? Because I think what we do is put money into education programs and ask states to do that. In contrast, as the legislation is written right now, states would be penalized and have money actually taken out of the money that's now available for highway construction. Uh, in, a, in a form of a penalty, and in the case of Wisconsin, it's up to $160,000 if they don't implement programs. But so you're, just say, you're saying your mandate is a better mandate. We agree, well, what we're saying is we agree that there is a problem. We agree people ought to be aware of it and ought to focus on it. But we, we do not feel that the solution to that problem ought to be mandated. Uh, oh, wait, so yours is not a mandate, then? It, ours is not the same type of mandate. Oh, there. but it's a mandate. It's just it's just a less less onerous it's mandate. It's not a mandate that there be a helmet on people. Oh, but it's a mandate. That, but but it's a mandate that you have that you have this education, and it's a mandate, I guess, under 21 that you do it. So it's you're a mandate that, they, that people be aware that riding a motorcycle is dangerous and how they ought to deal with it. But it's not a mandate that that we think that our solution to how to deal with that danger is uh, better uh, than theirs state. under all circumstances. What about, but, in, but under some circumstances, you're willing to say you know more than the state. Like if someone's under 21 years old. Right. So you know more than the state then, but but you don't know more than the state on I'm another occasion. I'm perfectly willing, if you think we can pass it, uh, to go all the way, yeah. but uh, we didn't get very far in committee or in subcommittee. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, gentlemen, very much for your testimony. All right, the committee would now be pleased to hear from Mr. Trafficant. Mr. Trafficant, if you have anyone on the same that agrees with you that you would like to have uh, be seated with you. I'd like to start out by saying, Mr. Chairman, it's safer to play football with a helmet than without. Oh, I can't recall. In Lugger. all leagues, Lugger. all Lugger. leagues Lugger. mandate the helmet uh, when you play. Well, <laughs> that has been rumored, but I want to make that the rumor has committee that I I wore a helmet all the time in away games. It was only home games where I chose to, to get dangerous. 
Who was the Detroit quarterback who played without a helmet? Bobby Lane. He That's played right. with a face mask. Didn't he also play for Lane Pittsburgh? Lane was a friend of mine. That's not dropping the name. In fact, he, he played he with the Steelers. Played his last Panthers. year in Pittsburgh, right. Yeah, we judge yeah. a few twist contests. Most, and some most I'm glad yes, to hear. Sir. I'm glad to hear that you played with a helmet because I have, <laughs> I've had several arguments out there on the floor about there. A lot of people that think you didn't play with. Yeah. Them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I let those rumors abound. Uh, uh, I'm not one of them. Well, like you're one of the one of the most distinguished members of this well, body. We'd be delighted to hear. And from. Uh, he has not accepted any of my amendments for years, and I'd like to just take a few minutes here. Number one, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding with that. Just kidding. I'd like to go on. Real briefly, I had a uh, Buy American Amendment Committee. They felt it would cause a sequential referral. They asked that I not offer it, and they said they'd tailor it around to make everybody happy with it and be acceptable, and they'd support it. All of my committee does support it. My leaders support it. I'm asking you to put it in order with the final language that they do draft that would be fine with everybody. And just let me say this. There is an awful lot of jobs in this bill, and that amendment is fair. It's met everybody's requirements, and it will help if the bill does become law to uh, amplify upon that point. But let me say one thing just briefly on the Second Amendment. One thing about this bill, and I know you're real busy, I think it's the most important part of this bill, and it's not been emphasized it should be, and that's traffic deaths and fatalities. And the initiative that the Congress takes to mitigate the tremendous amount of fatalities and deaths that occur on our highways, 55,000 a year. Now, what I wanted to offer to the committee is a highway safety incentive program that would make any safety improvement on a road 100% funded under the trust fund and under the act. They did not want to expand or mess with the 80-20 formula. Now, I'm asking you to just give me this minute, because I know you're busy. So I've redrafted an amendment the committee right now is looking at, and they sort of like parts of that, and they're willing to tailor it. But I'm asking the, the rules committee to accept this logic. You have a lot of poor communities like mine. They have limited funds to match federal or state funds. So they put it into surfacing, and they put it in their major priorities. The amendment that I'm offering on safety doesn't mess with the formula, but if it says the Department of Transportation is a state fine, one of these roads or projects is absolutely dangerous, has contributed to death, that it becomes a part of the project and a condition of the project that safety initiatives must be made as well. The reason for that is that some cities are, don't have the money for the match or states are using their match to provide uh, improvements for potholes and they're not making safety improvements as they need be. This amendment would give the respective Department of Transportation in the state the authority to make sure and ensure to make sure and ensure that those safety improvements are met. Let me just say this. I think Congress should have incentivized safety programs with 55,000 deaths a year. Congress stayed with the 80-20. I didn't fight with that. But what I am saying is that they find a roadway that's bad, and that community has limited funds, and they're going to apply it to road surface without taking care of the safety initiatives that were also needed. The state should be able to step in and say, look here, there's a condition of resurfacing that or using these funds, you've got to protect the traveling public because of the danger of that roadway. I think that's prudent. As a member of the committee, damn it, I understand this modified closed rule business. Now, under the 100% funded that I want as an incentive, the committee didn't want to mess with the 80-20 formula. But under this language here, they're right now looking at it very carefully, and I think they will accept the concept of it with some modifications that's absolutely necessary. But if we don't incentivize safety, what the hell are we doing as a highway program around here? 55,000 deaths a year. I think it's reasonable. Remember this, for all the highway safety in this bill to the Rules Committee, it's subject to an 80-20 match. And I'm telling you, those local politicians are concerned about potholes and resurfacing, and they're not taking care of those safety initiatives. And we in Congress should be ensuring it. And if we can incentivize it with 100% funding, and I'll buy that, then give the states the right to say, damn it, that's that roadway is dangerous, people are dying on it, and you're going to have to do that as a condition of that project, that infrastructure improvement. That's what the traffic and safety amendment says. That's good policy. If in my, my opinion, this should be the Highway Safety Act of 1992 with all the deaths we're having. So I 
I defer to everybody. And I'm not expanding any of the formulas. But I'm asking that it would still be that 80-20, but that State Department of Transportation, pursuant to the safety factors involved, can say as a condition of that improvement, you do and make those safety improvements. That's good policy, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Trafficant. Any I questions? have no questions. Any questions? Mr. Solomon. You sure support your First Amendment. Thank well, I'd appreciate consideration on this amendment, Chairman. Thank you very much. Do we have people up here? Yeah. Okay. Any other members of the Public Works Committee uh, waiting to testify? Not been called. If not, we'll go to the members of the Committee on Ways and Means. The Honorable Byron Dargan of North Dakota. Mike, you're not you're not on the same matter with. Okay. Byron. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, hearing me today. Uh, the previous speaker talked about traffic safety, and there is no more serious safety problem in this country than drunk driving. In this uh, piece of legislation, uh, the bill that's coming to the floor, there are some incentives on the drunk driving issue. In this country, there are 10 states in which it's perfectly legal, in much of the states, to get behind the wheel of a car, put your left hand on the steering wheel, your right hand to grasping an open whiskey bottle, and drive away drinking, it's perfectly legal. It is inconceivable to me that anybody in this country, any jurisdiction, ought to allow an open container of any kind in a moving vehicle. Yet in 10 states, you can drive and drink at the same time, and in another 20 states, an open container in the vehicle for other passengers is still legal. Hmm. Now, those of us that have had Which states are those, Byron? Well, I've, I've submitted or will submit it to, to the... Uh, I mean, a uh, panel. I've got a list of the states with the submission, but uh, are they. I, I don't think there are any on the East Coast, are there? Well, uh, some you can dr you can drive. Uh, you can load up a car with passengers and drive from uh, a fair part of the East Coast all the way to nearly the West Coast, and either be drinking while you're driving or have someone in the car drinking while you're driving and be legal all of the way. So. Uh, it, it's a rather meandering route, but you can do it. Uh, those of us who've had you members... drinking all the way, it would be a meandering <laughs> route. <laughs> and that's the problem, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Is that an endorsement? No, no. I, no, I, I was just surprised, because I know in Massachusetts, you, if you're caught well, in, with a, uh, an open container on the ca car, you, it's a fine. Well, I grew up in a... Yeah, no. I grew up in a state in which uh, open containers are prohibited in vehicles. It was a, it's a crime to have an open container in a vehicle. We yeah. just understood that. But there are many states in which that is not a crime, and there are other states in which not only is that not a crime, it's perfectly legal for the driver to drink. Hmm. It's just the driver can't be drunk. Well, I'm telling you, that's nuts. Alcohol shouldn't be in moving vehicles. Open containers shouldn't be allowed. Now, I have worked on this for a good many years, and uh, the fact is, we've made a little progress here and there. We provide incentives. This bill that's coming to the floor provides incentives for states to change their laws about open containers and about suspension or revocation of driver's license. But incentives aren't enough. I say at the end of the several-year incentive period in this bill, then let's withhold highway funds if they have not done both things. One, pass open container bills, that is, uh, pass laws that prohibit open containers in vehicles, and two, provide for automatic revocation of driver's license for those that are involved, involved in drunk driving. Uh, there are many of us that have lost family members in drunk driving accidents. Many others of you and uh, have lost loved ones. There isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know of somebody that's been killed by a drunk driver. Every 23 minutes, another person is killed by a drunk driver. People that get drunk and drive are committing murder on the highways, and it's about time some of us decide that we will not allow jurisdictions in this country to continue to say it's all right to drink while you drive. And we're better than a bill like this to offer an amendment to say, let's finally do this job. We tinker around with it year by year every time there's a little opportunity in the floor to talk about it. Let's finally do what we must do in public policy to separate alcohol from moving automobiles on this country's roads. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Any questions from the panel? Any questions? No. Mr. Solomon, any questions? No. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.
The next uh, member to testify will be the Honorable Bill Archer of Texas. Job yesterday. Let's see if that, we can repeat uh, it. That we met here in the same room to discuss a rule which was being brought under circumstances which really run, in my opinion, contrary to the rules and normal normal procedures of the House of Representatives. It's tempting for me simply to repeat my testimony of yesterday. And uh, in fact, maybe I'll just quit and let you read the record from yesterday. <laughs> but I'm but I'm not going to let you off that easy, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, you are in an uncomfortable position, and I understand that, of being told by, by your leadership to move a bill to the floor quickly. In fact, this bill's only been around for about two weeks. Uh, even, if, even if it might mean that House members will not have before them a copy of the committee report on the revenue title with minority views before they vote on this important legislation. In this case, the bill includes a $26 billion tax increase borne almost entirely by low- and middle-income Americans. And interestingly enough, unknown to a lot of people, it extends, in contrast to the recommendation of the Public Works Committee, it extends the five-cent tax that was agreed upon last year after the excruciating budget negotiations, where two and a half cents of that tax didn't go into the trust fund, but went into the General Treasury for a so-called deficit reduction, for another three years. So the five cent additional tax in the years from 1996 to 1998 will be split with only half of it being committed for infrastructure. The other half is a unilateral, gratuitous, regressive tax on low income and middle income Americans in the name of deficit reduction, and Mr. Chairman, the, I, I've got to say that we as Republicans, um, including the President, signed off on the budget agreement last year only because there were spending restraints. Now we're seeing a unilateral tax increase being used against the deficit without any quid pro quo of any spending restraints. And, and I, for one, object to that, and I think uh, a lot of the members of your committee will. I find it intriguing that the would-be champions of fairness in the tax code would rush through such a regressive tax without even taking the time to know what the full impact is going to be. Members ought to know that according to the Joint Committee estimates, which we publish, see published regularly that have distribution tables every time we pass a tax, 76% of this tax will be borne by families with less than $50,000 a year income. And the members of this committee should know that for those families who have $10,000 a year or less in family income, that they will have a 2.5% increase in their aggregate federal taxes. I'm not sure that that is a very wise thing for people in this body to do. Uh, but I think that the members ought to consider that according to CBO, the Republican tax policies of the last 10 years resulted in reductions in the federal income taxes for every single income group, from the lowest to the highest. It was only by including regressive payroll taxes enacted during the Carter years, and new regressive taxes such as this new gas tax, that it can be shown that lower income people lost ground since 1977 on the tax front. If the majority truly cares about tax relief for low and middle income working families, a good place to start would be to stop increasing their taxes. Mr. Chairman, there are a number of, of other points uh, that I could make, but I don't want to, to take up too much of the committee's valuable time. I simply wanted to point out that important information such as this may not be available prior to the consideration of the bill. If the leadership insists on rushing H.R. 2950 to the floor without adequate time to draft a committee report on Title VII, hopefully we'll have a chance to file that report and proceed in an orderly fashion. And quite honestly, I personally don't see why your leadership wants to force floor action on this legislation before the recess and send members home to explain why they just voted to increase taxes on working families 
of low and moderate income, particularly when it is clear to all of us who have served in this body that the other body will never pass a tax increase. Why subject the members of the House during the August recess to have to explain why they have passed such a regressive tax? Uh, in, and in closing, I, I do hope that uh, if you give a rule on this bill, in spite of what I've said, <laughs> that you will include a motion to recommit with or without instructions. Uh, given the haste with which your leadership has moved the bill forward, it's particularly important that that basic right uh, be sustained in this process. And just as importantly, it is apparently the only way under which I expect will be an otherwise closed rule that members of the House will have a chance to vote on whether we really have any business imposing a $26 billion tax on America's working families. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. listening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Any questions, Mr. Archer? Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Bill, uh, you weren't here earlier, but uh, Mr. Moakley had an opening statement, and, uh, and I did, and uh, we talked about the problems that we had run into in the past week. Uh, concerning how we were going to proceed and under what rules, in other words, regular rules of the House. And uh, as you all know, we had, we had uh, caused, ran into many problems, and uh, uh, consequently, the things were breaking down on the floor of the House and inconveniencing members, and we weren't accomplishing anything. And uh, I did commend uh, Mr. Moakley and the Speaker because uh, we had had uh, reasonable heads sit down and work these problems out. And uh, we uh, had come to an, uh, an agreement on both the unemployment insurance bill uh, and on the uh, highway bill. First of all, that you would have been, that they would there would be a reported bill. There would be a report uh, language that you would be able to offer minority views on. And uh, we assume that bill now is going to come before the floor uh, on Saturday. Uh, on this bill here, we have been assured that although we're going to have some problems in working out the rule, that we will be allowed. Uh, Mr. Michael will be allowed to offer a motion to recommit with instructions which could give us a, an up or down clean vote on this tax issue. Uh, lastly, the, well, the uh, gentleman yield yes, I'd be glad moment. to. Uh, I'm sure the gentleman's aware that our three days on Title VII does not expire until midnight on Saturday. I am aware of it. So if the bill comes up on Saturday, we will not have been given our, three, our normal three days uh, for views to appear in the committee report. Well, I think the, the committee was discharged last night, but on it, I understand what the gentleman said. But we're going to try to work that out with, with Mr. Michael to, uh, as far as the unemployment is concerned. On, uh, on this bill, of course, uh, there are amendments pending before the committee, uh, one of which is Mr. Michael's and another is Mr. Dreyer and Mr. Bennett's uh, amendment, which, uh, which would go a long way towards alleviating the, the uh, op opposition that the administration has. And we hope we're going to be able to make those in order, although it doesn't look like it at this point. So it's going to become contentious on the floor. But nevertheless, there is comedy, uh, I think, uh, now, because uh, we are getting some cooperation. So I want to commend you for helping to uh, lead the way on that. Well, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Solomon. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I particularly thank you. I've, I've watched the way you conduct this committee, and I think you always bend over to try to be fair, and this is what Mr. Solomon has just said. You haven't seen the arm lock that Mr. Solomon puts on. Uh, evidence of that, and, and, and I'm grateful for that, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, the minority would like to ask the minority some Mr. questions. Mr. Quillen. He was bending over so far he couldn't. Yeah, we appreciate your fairness, Mr. Chairman, letting us ask some I've questions. I've got a joke. I'll tell you about that later. Well, I, Dave, you asked so many questions from the la last couple of witnesses, I thought you were winded. <laughs> Not at all. I'm loaded for That was fair. Mr. Dryer. I'm loaded for fair, Mr. No, Bill, I just wanted to congratulate you. I, I think the closing days of the session bringing this bill and the other bills up during those hours is a bad judgment, but be as it may, this bill is on a fast track. How it will turn out, I don't know. It seems that it has a lot of merit to me. I wasn't here in the beginning of your testimony, but one of my close advisors told me that you have <coughs> some concern about it. Is that correct? I, I certainly do, um, uh, Mr. Dillon. <coughs> I, I have the concerns that I mentioned here, and of course there are others which uh, 
hopefully we will get into if you pass a rule uh, during the debate on the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As Mr. Quillen's close advisor, I'd like to uh, say that I'm pleased that I represented your views appropriately here. Uh, Bill, I uh, certainly congratulate you for your fine work and, and standing up for uh, what I believe is clearly the right thing to do on this issue. It is a, a very tough one. It seems to me to be rather ironic that the two issues that we're faced with in these closing days before the August recess have the potential to clearly contradict each other. This unemployment insurance package is something which clearly could provide an incentive for people to stay unemployed for a longer period of time, and this tax, which we've outlined here, is one which is going to exacerbate the jobless problem that we have and not do anything to turn the corner on it. In fact, one study that I've been given here shows that 234,000 jobs will uh, be uh, jeopardized if we see this uh, tax move ahead. You talked about those who were at that uh, bottom level, under $10,000, this being 2.5% of their federal tax burden. Um, have, have you looked at the figures at the jobs that this increased tax will cost? Yes, I've, I've seen studies that uh, relate to that, and the gentleman is accurate in that regard. It will cost jobs. It will also raise a lever, level of inflation. The cost of living for all Americans will go up mm -hmm. as a result of this. Have you had a chance to look at the proposal that uh, the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bennett, and I are going to propose to offer? I was very concerned when my ranking member, Mr. Solomon, said that he thought that the chance of our getting it through was not all that great. Uh, I hope he'll continue to fight for me here, even though he said that he thought we might not be able to get it through. But uh, have you had a chance How to... How about voting right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We got the votes. We'll do it, Mr. Chairman. I saw the but we don't have a quorum. Ah, that's right. Have you had a, a chance to look at the, the I, proposal? I, I have not looked at it Basically, carefully. Basically, what it does, Bill, is it, it uh, eliminates demonstration projects, increases, increases the opportunity for donor states to get a higher percentage. In fact, it benefits 40 states, and it eliminates what we're talking about here, the tax. Well, that's, that sounds like a constructive approach. I must also tell you that our colleague, Mr. Grandy, who I believe will come up shortly to testify, has got an interesting proposal right, that he offered in the that. committee that I, I think makes uh, good sense, and that is to take the two and a half cents that was passed under the budget agreement to go into the general treasury and put it back in the highway trust fund, mm -hmm. where I believe it belongs, for use in the building of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And and then to let the, the budget act unfold in its normal process uh, relative to those monies in the fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll let him explain more that about it. That sounds very reasonable. I know Mr. McEwen has an interest in that amendment, too. But that would that would permit additional monies to be used for infrastructure without uh, having the effect of uh, inflation mm -hmm. and recessionary effect and re and regressive Thank you. Uh, effect. Now that Chairman Moakley has returned, I'll yield back the balance of my time. I didn't take long, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, do you have any questions? Mr. McEwen. Thank you. Bill, I greatly appreciate your testimony. I agree wholeheartedly in everything that you've said. Uh, let me, I'd appreciate your explanation as to what the Ways and Means Committee was thinking and, and what is the actual case on this idea of taking s some more of the money that uh, from the gas tax and dropping it into the black hole of, quote, debt reduction, unquote. As I understand it, th this afternoon or yesterday, they said that we'll increase the tax five cents a gallon. But since that's deductible for some people, we'll take some of the five cents and put it over in, in another account. Is that not correct? Well, that, that is not precisely correct. Uh, I did speak to the extension of the five cents that was passed last year for another three years, and that's one subject. But the question of the new five cents uh, that was approved is a question of whether the gross amount or the net amount goes into the Highway Trust Fund. The interaction between the income tax and the sales tax, as it were, on gasoline is the result that only about 75 percent of what's collected is a net benefit to the federal government. And the reason for that is of the new money. 
of the new money. The reason for that is because when you increase the gas tax, you increase the deductible expenses for every business in the country which is taken against the ordinary income tax. Right. But that hasn't cost you and, anything because that's but, new money, right? But, but what it costs you is a reduction in income tax revenues that are coming in, and the result of that would precipitate a sequestration, most of which would be borne by the Medicare fund. Wait. So we really had no alternative, uh, and although I voted against the tax increase, the majority that voted for it had no alternative but to let only the net amount go into the Highway Trust Fund. Otherwise, we would have had the untoward result of an automatic sequestration of Medicare funds in the billions of dollars. And I don't think any member of this body would have, would have liked to see that happen. I, I just don't think that the Public Works Committee anticipated that when they designed their bill. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Archer, once again, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Mike Andrews of Texas. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for giving me some time. I, this is a very clear amendment. Uh, I, I've also brought a few photographs that I think are illustrative of um, the reasons uh, and the necessity for this amendment. This amendment has to do with billboards. There are four relatively simple parts to the amendment. Uh, the first uh, is that no uh, new billboards can be constructed within 2,500 feet of a national historic site uh, or a national park. Uh, the second is that in the future, uh, tree cutting in front of billboards that uh, are presently illegal, non-conforming billboards, would be prohibited. Uh, amazingly, there are 18 states right now that allow billboard companies to cut down trees in front of billboards that are illegally placed uh, in a spot in a, in a local city or, or a state. And this tries to close that small loophole. Um, thirdly, uh, it changes the penalty that the Department of Transportation is now able to impose on states that don't conform in the past or presently. Uh, if a state does not comport with the law, the Department of Transportation must imposed a mandatory 10 percent reduction in their highway funds, a very, very severe penalty. And what my amendment attempts to do is simply make that punishment discretionary. In other words, to give the Department of Transportation the option of not imposing such a severe penalty. In practice, what has happened since the Highway Beautification Act is that the penalty is never imposed because generally these kinds of violations occur in fairly isolated instances, and the, the penalty would just simply be, simply be too severe. And fourthly, uh, and I suppose uh, the, the portion of the amendment that, that would be considered controversial, it, there is a loophole in the Highway Beautification Act. It was always intended when the, uh, by the drafters of the Highway Beautification Act that billboards would be restricted along our highways in commercially, industrially, industrialized zoned areas. Because of the wording of the uh, Highway Beautification Act, which says, quote, that build unzoned commercial and industrial areas would allow billboards, what has happened is a terribly broad interpretation of what an unzoned commercial and industrial area is. And the reason for the large photograph will show you uh, an area along an interstate highway in which a uh, rural scenic uh, part of our country was declared commercial industrial area simply because a railroad track uh, ran through the property, a railroad track. And all the amendment does is eliminate that provision. These are for new billboards. It has absolutely nothing to do with those you can see in the photograph, but simply says in the future. It's all right to build a billboard, but it needs to be in a commercially zoned industrial area. So what we've tried to do is first deal with national parks, some of which are, are at great risk as cities move toward uh, into rural areas, especially near Manassas Battlefield or Shiloh National Battlefield Park. Also try to 
eliminate the, as you can see from the photograph, a billboard being placed literally across the street from the entrance to the Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg National Battlefield. Doesn't affect any of the billboards in the photograph. Does not say you have to tear a billboard down. It simply says within 2,500 feet you can't build new billboards. Have you talked to the chairman of the study on this? Like yes, I have. Uh, the chairman uh, is uh, willing to consider in conference uh, only that portion of the amendment that has to do with historic sites. But, but nothing this is a, evidently on the Public Works Committee uh, an issue that was uh, not even presented uh, as an amendment. It uh, would, would, would simply not, uh, I don't think it would have prevailed and I think the attitude of the proponents was that it uh, would be useless to try to go forward with it at that time. I spoke with Chairman Rowe today and he said that in the conference they would consider the, the section on National Historic Sites. You know, really, to, to oppose this means that it's, it, you really have to say it's okay to cut down trees in front of an illegal billboard, because that's what's happening across the country. It's okay to build a billboard in front of Faneuil Hall or, or the Alamo in my state within 2,500 feet, uh, that it's okay to say in a rural scenic area that it's commercial simply because a railroad track runs through it. Uh, all my amendment attempts to do really is to close some loopholes. And what we've attempted to do is avoid this very contentious debate about uh, paying billboard owners for taking their billboards down. We don't deal with that at all. This does not affect currently existing billboards, even those that are illegally placed. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mike, of course, you were on the, the Public Works Committee before you went on the Ways and Means Committee, so you are familiar with the jurisdiction of that committee and the way it operates. And, I assume that the reason you're offering this is that uh, this is the only legislative vehicle of any consequence moving out of public works that relates to this issue generally, and it's the only vehicle that you have in this Congress to offer this Well, amendment. that is correct, and I, I want to add uh, to uh, uh, Martin that I think uh, if Chairman Rowe were here, he would also raise a, a concern about jurisdictional elements with the Interior Committee, and uh, that was something that was raised to me uh, by the Chairman. But Yes, this is the only way to deal with this problem. I mean, we've not had a billboard amendment on the floor in, in several years, and uh, this, this will be a, a vote and an opportunity for members to speak out on not existing billboards, but, but billboards in the future. Of course, the Chairman of the Interior Committee is here, and he may have the opportunity to speak on this. I assume he's here on some other subject, though. Um, Mike, is there any uh, realistic opportunity that you might be able to incorporate a portion of this into the chairman's in block committee amendments? Well, as I said, I asked them, um, I asked the staff and I asked the chairman uh, if they would consider uh, what portions they would agree to of the amendment, and I was told that only the National Historic Site provision they would consider in the conference. I, uh, they were not receptive to uh, including this in their in their in block amendments. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Solomon. Thank you. Thank you very Ms. much. Ms. Slaughter. No, sir. Ms. Dreyer. Ms. McHugh. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Honorable Fred Grandy. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, first, let me say, although he's not here, I'd like to thank uh, our ranking uh, member Mr. Archer of the Ways and Means Committee for plugging my proposal to you before I even got here. I, I appreciate his support. I, uh, I had it in committee yesterday when I offered it. But let me, let me begin by saying what, I, what I'm asking the committee to do. You have before you, I'm sure, the proposal that the Ways and Means Committee passed out, which involves a five cent gas tax as per the request of the Public Works Committee, and in addition to that, an extension of the two and a half cent deficit reduction tax, uh, which would be used still for deficit reduction. As you know, in that particular Ways and Means proposal, there is a stipulation that only the net revenues from the gas tax can be spent. This will effectively reduce the funding of the House bill by about 25 percent. So even upon passage of that, uh, of that proposal tomorrow, if indeed it does, does pass, the House Ways and Means, or the House Public Works Committee will probably have to go back and re- uh, design some of their special projects or cut some of them to meet the new funding obligations. I only say that because yesterday in Ways and Means, Chairman Rostenkowski offered this proposal as option A, as something that members might consider as a funding mechanism for the Public Works Bill. 
I would ask the committee to make my option in order as an option B, not to eliminate or substitute Chairman Rostenkowski's amendment, but to offer it in concert with Chairman Rostenkowski's amendment, because I think it offers members another choice to have an option to increase the funding for our uh, interstate systems and our uh, bridge projects and even our special projects that are outlined in the bill without raising the gas tax. And let me go into some detail as to how this would work. First of all, what I am proposing, as Mr. Archer said, is I would take the two and a half cents that was designated in OBRA 89 in the Budget Enforcement Act that was used and earmarked for deficit reduction and move that back in to the Highway Trust Fund for the duration of the budget agreement. That means, Mr. Chairman, it could not be spent because you could not spend that money and still be in compliance with the budget caps. So that two and a half cents would sit in the trust fund for five years. The contributions and the interest would accrue until the end of the budget agreement. In the last year of the highway bill, that money would come due and it would be, it would be roughly about $12 billion for our highways, about $3.1 billion for our mass transit system, and could be spent accordingly uh, as the Public Works Committee so designates. So what we're basically doing is backloading the highway bill, not raising taxes, but increasing both the administration proposal and the Senate proposal uh, in terms of funding for our Public Works projects. So I see this proposal as having five and possibly six advantages. First of all, obviously, we don't raise gas taxes at a time when this nation is battling a recession. In my state of Iowa, I would just say, and by the way, Iowa does very well under this bill. My district does well under this bill. But the problem is that although we are not in a recession in the heartland, a gas tax coupled with downward spiraling grain, gain, grain prices, uh, problems with our rural infrastructure, is really something that could really plummet us into a recession or a repeat of what we went through in the mid-80s. I would not think that the, a five cent gas tax would be worth that price. Second, as I said earlier, at the end of fiscal year 96, which is the last year of the budget agreement and the next to last year of the highway bill, you would have an additional $12 billion in the highway trust fund and an additional $3.1 billion in the transit account. So you have $15 billion that you can spend without raising taxes. The only caveat is you can't spend those dollars until the last year of the bill, so you would have to redesign the allotments for your projects accordingly. Now that does not support the current level of funding under the highway bill. The Intermodal Surface Transportation Act is $121 billion. But this would provide, as I said, more money than the Senate bill, roughly $12 billion more, and about $20 billion more than the administration proposal. So it is conceivable that every single project that is designated under the present Public Works bill could be funded, but perhaps not at quite the same generous levels as the committee proposed now. And most of the funding, as I said, would come in the out years. Third, a concept that just about everybody in this body, and I think just about everybody in this Congress agrees with, is why raise taxes when you have a trust fund? Why not draw down that trust fund? That's exactly what this bill does. Uh, it, is, it even does it more than the Nickel for America does. But it does not violate either the Byrd Amendment or the Rostenkowski Amendments that say you have to keep a certain balance in the trust fund. It is in keeping with that. Fourth, there is a possibility, Mr. Chairman, that if you, if you put the deficit reduction two and a half cents back into the trust fund, you would make money because it would be earning interest for four years. It couldn't be spent. And in those four years, you would be reducing the deficit because everybody knows we, uses the, we use the trust fund as a, an accounting mechanism against the deficit. I don't personally agree with that, but that happens to be the law of the land right now. Why not take advantage of a bad situation? At the end of that two and four years, you've got all of that contribution plus the interest. If you leave it in the general fund, Mr. Chairman, you're spending it. You not only don't accrue interest, you probably don't really have much meaningful deficit reduction. Finally, um, as Mr. Archer specified, a lot of us, and I include myself, who supported reluctantly the Deficit Reduction Act last year, had a hard time taking gas taxes and using them for any other purpose than supposedly the user fee purpose that they've originally been designated for, which is 
our transportation needs. Why not change that precedent now, get deficit reduction, and go back to a concept that I think most members would be, would be supportive of? Under the chairman's proposal, Mr. Raskinkowski's proposal, the two and a half cents for deficit reduction is extended through 1998. Now, I don't mind doing that. As a matter of fact, I do that, but I leave it in the trust fund. So the problem is, is that if you take two and a half cents, extend it all the way out to 1998, you will continue to fund deficit reduction on the backs of gas tax. And I will not, I will not uh, reiterate the, uh, the facts and figures that Mr. Archer made about whether this is a regressive tax or not. Finally, let me just make one point that, that I made earlier about the net revenues versus the gross revenues. You put this option into your rule, you don't have that problem because you're not spending the money until the Deficit Reduction Act is over, so you can spend 100 percent of all your monies. You're not, you're not in, subject to any budget caps that we know of now. So on that note, Mr. Chairman, I will, uh, I'll be pleased to yield back and, uh, and take any questions the committee might have. All, all I ask is that I think that if we're going to really consider a five-cent gas tax on the threshold of a recession, I think it at least is in order for the committee to allow an amendment to go forward that at least provides an option to have at least part of your cake and eat it too, even if you have to wait four years to have the biggest piece. And on that, I would, I would yield back. Mr. Grandy, according to your option, then, uh, nothing would take place in the Public Works Bill until four years down the line? Oh, no. You still have all of the budget resolution figures. and. Uh, have we, have we got those figures, John? There, there, are, there is, uh, yeah, the budget resolution levels, Mr. Chairman, under the, under the present bill, without the gas tax, would be $16 billion in 92, $18 billion in 93, $20 billion in 94, and $22 billion in 95. That's, that's what you can spend under the budget agreement. As a matter of fact, that's all you can spend unless you have the gas tax. What I'm saying is let's adhere to those levels for the first four years while the, while the highway bill and the budget agreement run parallel. And, and in the end, you take the money you've socked away and complete whatever projects you began to fund in the first four years. And what would, what would be the difference in the overall uh, cost of those projects as opposed to what the uh, Public Works is looking for now? I think they're looking for a total of $153 yeah. billion. Well, $153 billion if you assume they could spend uh, the, 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 the receipts from the, from the gas tax are about $30 billion over five years. Right. Take three quarters of that, and that's probably what, what they really have to spend. So you figure in, in the first year, I think they figured $6.5 billion. Three quarters of that is $5.1 billion. That's what they'd have to spend. Under, under my bill, uh, in, you wouldn't have $30 billion you would probably have closer to about um, 12 or 15 billion to spend. So in a sense, it splits the difference between the Senate bill, which is, which is less than I offer, and, and the House bill, which is more. This proposal, as I specified, is, is quite a bit more generous, generous than the administration proposal. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bielenson, have any questions? No, he doesn't, thanks. Mr. Solomon? Fred, uh, what was the uh, what was the vote on your your uh, substitute in the uh, committee? Well, let me let me set the scene. First of all, in the committee, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Salmon, this amendment was a substitute to Chairman Rostenkowski's amendment. Amazingly, it failed. <laughs> uh, but it failed by a vote of 25 to 10 and on a bipartisan basis. There were some Democrats that supported it. Um, I subsequently have heard from members of the committee that uh, they thought it was a novel concept, but because of the circumstances surrounding the author of the original amendment, they were probably compelled to vote against it. Uh, as, as an amendment that basically was crafted at the 11th hour as a way to allow members a chance to have increased highway funding without a gas tax, I was rather pleased with that vote. Uh, most of the members on our side that voted against it were guys that have already declared for the highway bill, and uh, we knew we'd <coughs> lost their votes anyway. So 25 to 10 is, was the final count. Well, you know, you say novel concept, but uh, the, uh, the toughest thing, I think, that, uh, that opinionated 
or principled members of Congress have to learn around here, and some of us never do learn it, uh, is the art of compromise, because you feel you're compromising your principles. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned before you came in uh, early on this, this afternoon that um, we just debated a striker uh, replacement bill in which uh, labor was opinionated and uh, they were adamant about no changes, no amendments. Business was the same way, and consequently they will end up with nothing, and we will have wasted all of our time on that issue. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing here. You know, your, uh, your concept, uh, according to the administration's uh, uh, position, uh, is one of those areas where we, we could come up with a compromise where something would take place and, and probably be signed into law. Well, it either has to be, let me just finish one yeah. second, it either has to be your approach or Mr. Walker's approach or Bob Michael's approach or uh, the Bennett Dreyer approach. Uh, or we're not going to have a bill. I mean, and this ought to be obvious to everybody. And uh, your, your approach really does make a lot of sense. I'm going to try to move to make your amendment in order because it is one of those, those uh, areas where it ought to be debated by the entire House. And, well, and, and let the House work its will. Go ahead. I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Solomon. I, I, I want to say again, I've got more than, than special projects in this bill. We have a major corridor of national significance running through Iowa that is funded in this project. It would have been funded under the Senate bill as well. But what I really can't afford is a veto and to begin this process all over again because I don't want to move the construction and the planning on this back a year. So this amendment is designed as a compromise not just to members of this committee in the full house but also to the White House. I can't tell you whether they will fully support this. I can tell you there are things in this they don't like. But I'm sure they're going to bill, get a bill they're not going to like anyway. And the, I think the whole idea is to whittle down the differences before it actually hits the president's desk. This is an attempt to do that. Well, my whole point was that uh, we, have, we have heard testimony here. And uh, it's obvious that uh, when the final product comes out that we will probably have a rule uh, that is not going to allow any of these approaches we were talking about to be debated on the floor. And it's going to lead to exactly what you just said. We'll end up with no bill. There will be no construction. It will be set back a whole year. Uh, and we can't afford that at this present time. President Bush has proven that uh, uh, he is a compromiser and that uh, uh, certainly uh, he did that when he agreed to the tax increase last year, uh, which you voted for and I didn't. And I admire you for it. Uh, but, uh, something <laughs> I'm not sure I admire myself for it. But, <laughs> but uh, something's got to be done. And uh, certainly your approach is one of them. And I appreciate well, you coming before the committee. Uh, if, I, if I could just clarify something, Fred, I think it is a novel approach, but my understanding was that 100 percent of the nickel for America went into this highway bill. And you're saying only 75 percent? It will only be 75 percent because the Ways and Means Committee in their, in their Title VII, which is the funding mm -hmm. mechanism, specified that only the net revenues could be spent. When you factor in the business exemptions right. and and some of the other tax exemptions you will only get 75 cents on every dollar I see. so in other words the money that the that the, the public works committee thought it had to spend on all these projects is only about three quarters of what they thought mm -hmm. they had that's Great. not true by the way under this proposal thank you mr quillen i have no questions great presentation i appreciate your coming thank you mr quillen Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, want to congratulate uh, my friend from Iowa for an excellent presentation. Uh, and you make a very compelling case for something that clearly those of us on this side uh, uh, want to do. I wonder what kind of response you would have to the item that we had discussed earlier, the, the amendment that uh, the Chairman Bennett and I are going to be offering, which would uh, eliminate the demonstration projects and the tax and uh, increase the donor level for uh, uh, well, I um, obviously states. I agree with you on, on getting rid of the tax because I do that as well. Uh, in terms of getting rid of the demonstration projects, having not looked at your legislation, I, I, I don't want to comment. But I would just say this. Um, I can't tell you under the present designation of the bill what's a demonstration project and what is a corridor of national significance mm -hmm. and what is a regional route. So I. I don't know what, what you're cutting there. Are you cutting the... They actually um, label them special projects uh, in here. And... Are uh, they labeled as special projects in the bill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Well, I'm happy to yield. I believe you'll find that there are 
listed as innovative projects, rural projects, and uh, one other designation. Well, I, I guess I guess my response to that, uh, Mr. Dreyer, would be. Um, my amendment in essentially reduces funding level, so you're going to have to make choices about projects too. I would, uh, I support you in principle because I think one of the problems we're having with this bill is too much was added to it too late, and I would, I would support taking that excess out. I guess personally, I would support giving the Public Works Committee that responsibility, although they may not want it. Uh, I would. I would think that if they were given reduced funding levels, okay. that's something they would have to do. Maybe they would just lower the funding authorizations for all of these projects. I don't know. Maybe they'd cut some out. I'm sure a lot of studies would be defunded. But uh, at this point, I, I don't see your amendment and my amendment as being inconsistent with one another no, because that's, obviously that's, they, they, in a sense, complement one another in terms of the really dollars. Sense we, sense yeah. They do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Strongly agree. For sure. I have two of them. Two amendments to do the same thing that he does in one, so I wish you the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Mark. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Any other members from the Committee on Ways and Means present wishing to testify? If not, we'll move to the Honorable Judge Bennett of Florida. Charles Bennett, I'm sorry, of Florida. I'm looking at George Miller talking about Ch Charles Bennett. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Dyer. I was co-sponsoring this, and the boxes here well. And uh, I appreciate very much the committee allowing me to make this presentation. As a result of adverse uh, editorial comment directed toward Congress as a whole and the Florida delegation not <coughs> taking care of the interests of of the transportation in our area fairly under the national law. I asked the State Department of Transportation to come forth with a bill, and uh, they uh, did so, and they handed me the bill that had been worked out by the Departments of Transportation and American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. I introduced the bill with Congressman Dreyer and 132 other co-sponsors Congressman Dreyer and I seek your permission to offer the provision of this legislation, which is H.R. 2566, as an amendment to the highway bill. <clears throat> Basically, the bill attempts to address the equity issue of creating two programs, the National Highway System, which distributes one-third of the money based on lane miles, one-third based on statewide vehicle miles traveled, and one-third based on statewide diesel fuel use. <clears throat> and the urban and rural highway and bridge system, which distributes money on a dollar and dollar, dollar in, dollar out basis. You may ask what makes this formula more fair and equitable when compared with the committee bill. The formula in my bill is a true reflection of transportation needs. Distributing money based on lane miles determines the extent of a state's transportation system. Vehicle miles traveled determines the use of the system. And diesel fuel use is a true reflection of the wear and tear caused by semi-truck travel. Doesn't it seem logical that money would be appropriated to the states based on extent of use and wear and tear? But don't take my word for it. Realize that this formula was developed by transportation officials across the country who work at the source of transportation pressures. The House Public Works Committee, though, <clears throat> thought highly of this formula, enough to include it in 45% of their bill. Unfortunately, the rest of the committee's formula do not reflect the true need. Instead, in the remaining six formula established by the committee, one can find such bizarre factors as rural and urban mail route delivery millage, mileage, pardon me, a state lands area, and the 1980 census figures. You have visions of a horse and buggy rural route uh, uh, contrasted with 1991 six-lane highways. A more serious concern, however, is the fact that over 10 percent of the committee's bill is distributed without a formula at all. Instead, it is distributed at the complete discretion of the committee. Such a process subverts the normal formula distribution process and eliminates the need and cost-based analysis of the State Departments of Transportation. This is not the way to craft landmark legislation or to spend federal funds. I do not doubt that all 50 states need new transportation projects. My point, however, is that all transportation funds should be distributed through an equitable formula for states to use in completing 
and initiating projects of importance. I'm grateful to Chairman Rowe and Chairman Mineta for their graciousness to me and others and for the portions of my bill which they included in their committee legislation. Their desire to achieve extra legislation is recognized and deeply appreciated. However, to achieve true equity, the transportation bill we passed should not apply fair formulas to just 45 percent of the bill. Instead, a fair distribution formula must be applied to the entire bill under the theory that just as each state has contributed their fair share to the program, so should they receive money on that same basis. At the Democratic caucus, it was asked, uh, said there, that a provision of the committee bill to ensure that a state will receive 90 percent of its percentage of the trust fund. That's what was said there. But this is true in the Bennett Dreyer bill, but not so in the committee's bill. $4.7 billion worth of discretionary spending in the committee's bill has no 90 percent guarantee at all. However, even if the 90 percent applied to the entire committee bill, the fairness intent of the Bennett Dreyer amendment would still not be achieved. The 90 percent minimum allocation in both bills is a minimum guarantee. The difference, however, is that, that one, the committee bill does not apply the 90 percent to discretionary spending, and two, the Bennett Dreyer amendment uses need based formulas to distribute money to the states at a level that is usually higher than 90 percent. While the committee bill uses formulas which usually yield a return for donor states of not more than 90 percent. I can be uh, adamant about this and desiring fairness because I compare the rates in return of the committee's bill and the legislation that which Mr. Dreyer and I have introduced. Under the committee's bill, Florida would receive 79 percent on the dollar, just 5 percent more than we averaged under the first the last five years. A more compelling statistic, however, is that our payments to the trust fund will exceed our receipts by $1.1 billion. That's $400 million more than we contributed from 1986 to 1990. How can I take this home to my constituents on top of a five-cent gas tax? I'm opposed to raising revenue without distributing the funds fairly. Florida should not be alone in this desire for equity. California's rate of return under the committee bill would be 79 cents. My bill would provide them 91 cents. The committee gives 79 cents of its dollar to tax Texas. My bill, Mr. Dreyer's bill, provides 95 percent of the dollar. And just like Florida, their exports to the trust fund will increase. Look at the numbers. Those states who gave more than their fair share over the last 35 years We'd like the rest of the country to receive a fair return under Mr. Dreyer's bill in mind. We aren't asking to reverse our status as donor states. In fact, donor states would still contribute more to the trust fund than they receive by far a, a large amount. Again, I appreciate the lengths to which the committee has gone, but if we are crafting landmark legislation which will carry us into the 21st century, it ought to be uh, done on a basis that's fair to all states, and the donor states have made too heavy a contribution at this point. Mr. Bacchus is with me now, and he'd like to probably say something. Mr. Bacchus of Florida. I'd like to defer to Mr. Dreyer, who's co-sponsored the amendment. Mr. Dreyer of California. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I figured, Mr. Chairman, that I would probably save the committee a great deal of time if I made a presentation rather than ask questions. I seem to take more time doing that, I know. But I uh, will just very, You're very. welcome, no matter what the forum, whether you want to thank be on that side much. or this side. Thanks for the invitation to be here, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'd just like to say that I was privileged to be asked by uh, Mr. Bennett to join him in support of this measure, which clearly is, I believe, the most fair and equitable way to deal what is a, a very troubling question. I quoted earlier, uh, when uh, one of the other witnesses was here, the statement that was made by the majority leader on the House floor yesterday, when he said that if we are going to see any modification in this gas tax, we clearly must see a commensurate reduction in the programs that are included in the package itself. And when he made that statement, it became obvious to me that the one solution here was the Bennett Dreyer substitute. Because what we're trying to offer is a chance to see an increased benefit for these states. And contrary to what members of the Public Works Committee said when they were here earlier, there are loads of what uh, my expert uh, advisor, Mr. Quillen, uh, reminded me are rural access, innovative projects, and congestive relief projects. I call them special or demonstration projects that clearly have not been established as priorities by local and state governments. And we've seen this tremendous increase in the numbers of those over the past several years. And uh, it seems to me that getting back to that 
local control and individual initiative along with getting people in the donor states back to a level of return on what they send to Washington that is closer to the amount that they send is a much better route for us to take. And I've shown you, Mr. Chairman, I've shown the gentleman from New York and from Tennessee, my colleague from California, my friend from Ohio, that over four, that 40 states, at least 40 states, will have a higher rate of return under this Bennett Dreyer package, and I think it'll be a, a very good one. And I hope that we can include this uh, in the measure when it comes to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Bacchus. Mr. Bacchus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was a co-sponsor of the FAST bill introduced by Mr. Bennett, and I'm a very strong supporter of uh, the Bennett Dreyer substitute. Uh, I believe it deserves a chance to be debated and decided on the floor. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my particular perspective. I represent the 11th Congressional District in Florida. That's Central Florida, Orlando and the Space Coast down to Vero Beach. It's one of the most populous districts in the country. The most recent census tells us that nine of the 11 fastest growing metropolitan areas in America are in Florida. Two of those nine are in my congressional district, Orlando and Melbourne. Before coming to Congress, I served for a time as general counsel to Florida State Growth Planning Commission. Part of our charge was to tote up the backlog of infrastructure needs in, in our state. Uh, that backlog now is reaching $30 billion in transportation alone. Florida has been a donor state for many years. In the past five years, Florida has uh, sent $760 million more in federal gasoline tax receipts to Washington, D.C. than we have gotten in return. Uh, excuse me? Over how many years was that, Mr. Backus? Over the past five years. Florida ranks 50th among the 50 states in our rate of return right now in terms of gasoline tax receipts. Under the committee bill, we would still rank last, tied with a few other states. Under the committee bill, over the next five years, Florida would send $1.1 billion more into the Treasury coffers here in Washington than we would get back in terms of receipts. Now, uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, the money should go to where the needs and the people are. It should be distributed fairly. I don't think anyone can reasonably argue that fast-growing states such as Florida need more transportation dollars than they would receive under this bill. I want to be for a bill. I certainly support the need to fund transportation. But I see no way that I can support uh, a tax increase uh, that would simply ask Floridians to pay more in taxes uh, to build roads and transit systems elsewhere. Uh, this is one nation, and we have to work together as a nation. But uh, it's, it's too much to ask donor states to donate more than their fair share, even under the Bennett bill, as uh, Congressman Bennett uh, pointed out. Florida and these other states will still remain donors. Over the next five years, under the Bennett Dreyer substitute, Florida would send $400 million more to Washington than we would get back. That's a lot of money, but it's a lot less than $1.1 billion. So $700 million is at stake for my state. Uh, in the decision between the committee bill and the Bennett Dreyer substitute. Now, I have some money in terms of special projects uh, in this bill, and I'm grateful for the work that Chairman Rowe and, and Chairman Mineta and Congressman Peterson and others in Public Works have done. They have incorporated our FAST concept to a, a certain extent, but not enough. I have to judge whether uh, I want uh, a few million dollars for a few important projects in my district at the expense of fairness for the entire state. And in, in judging that, I have decided that uh, I need to work for what's best for the entire state, and I think the entire country. As I said, the money should go to where the needs and the people are. And therefore, uh, I would appreciate uh, your efforts to uh, allow a, a, a debate and a vote on the Bennett Dreyer substitute on the floor of the House. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Solomon, Ms. Quillen. Yes, uh, would your substitute uh, eliminate all of these projects? The, uh, the example product supposed to work for that. Uh, well, yes, it does eliminate all the projects. Congressional projects of national significance. It, it, uh, it eliminates these special projects which come usually characteristically from a chamber of commerce or somebody who's got some interest out there that, that wants an interplay done and he can't get it done by the state. The state's not willing to uh, use the ordinary funds that come from the federal government to do it. Doesn't feel like it's worth it. And that's that's characteristically what these projects are. 
their projects that can't make it uh, through the state distribution of federal funds. <laughs> and I must say that would be a very healthy, clean thing if you can get rid of them. It doesn't have the proper test. It's not tested properly. And, and that's a very healthy thing about the Dreyer Bennett bill. It gets rid of that. Something we should get behind us. It's not, it's not a good spectacle to see the way in which this money is distributed. I, I had a dozen questions to ask Mr. Dreyer. I notice he's <laughs> abandoned back up here as a member of the committee now. Why don't you and two I'll have pass. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to uh, extend hearty congratulations to Mr. Bennett, especially on his choice as a co-sponsor of the amendment, <laughs> and uh, to say that it's uh, been a privilege to work with you. And I hope very much, Mr. Bennett, that we're able to carry this to the House floor. And I'll ask no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. I certainly appreciate it if you can and make it possible. Thank you very much. I have a final Bye. word that I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, before leaving. I, I was with a member in the elevator the other day, and the member was from uh, a state up north. And he said, you know, Florida is growing. How many people are there in Florida today? Three, four million? Mr. Chairman, there are at least 13 million people in our state. Uh, Florida has uh, a, a growth rate that brings us nearly 1,000 people a day in terms of new residents, and that's net. Florida will pass New York within the next two to three years as the third most populous state uh, in this country. It'll be a long time till you catch up with California. It'll be a long time till we catch up to California, and frankly, I don't want to. But Florida and California and Texas and the growing parts of this country deserve fairness from the Congress of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, if you keep growing like that, you'll have enough congressmen to pass your own bill. <laughs> the problem there, Mr. Chairman, like is uh, this is a five-year bill, and uh, I don't think we want to wait five patient. years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The uh, Honorable George Miller, California. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Mr. Kanye. Mr. Kanye, you want to both come up together? We can do it together. Mr. Chairman. Good pair. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to have uh, Chairman Miller join me here. I, I have uh, two matters, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to bring them to your attention relating to H.R. 2950. Uh, the legislation dealing with the surface transportation. The first matter relates to a proposed amendment by my friend, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. McEwen, which unfortunately is not germane and would unwisely give the Attorney General radical new powers without any consideration by the committees of jurisdiction. The second matter relates to the budgetary treatment in Section 104 of the reported le legislation which would affect highway construction program treatment under the Budget Enforcement Act. Both these matters fall squarely within the jurisdiction of the Government Operations Committee. I reiterate, uh, Mr. Chairman, my appreciation of the support that you've long provided to standing committees of jurisdiction in not allowing rules to be granted that would allow non-germane amendments falling in the jurisdiction of other committees to be offered. With reference to the McEwen Amendment, which proposes that the Attorney General be empowered to block any federal regulation upon determination that it may involve a taking of private property rights within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, it's a, an enormous delegation of power. Uh, mind-blowing might be a more popular description of it, to the Attorney General without any attention to, uh, given to the processes of openness and accountability that are now required under the regulatory process established by the Administrative Procedure Act and under the rules of the House under 10.1J that describes the Government Operations Committee jurisdiction, this matter falls squarely under our jurisdiction and is also clearly uh, not germane to the legislation before you, the stated purpose of which, of course, is to develop a national intermodal service transportation system and to authorize funds for construction of highways, highway safety programs, and mass transit programs. Now, during the last two years, our committee has been attempting to undertake the reauthorization of the Office of uh, 
management and budget that conducts uh, review re regulations. Uh, many processes for the review were implemented without congressional authorization and have resulted, frankly, in the delay and blocking of health and safety and other critical regulations that Congress mandated. These processes also allowed the regulatory decision-making process to be done in secret, frankly, and out of public view contrary uh, to the intent of the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, this proposal is a, a continuation of that process uh, to which I must object. Uh, documents obtained by our committee clearly demonstrate that this proposal was developed by the Council on Competitiveness chaired by the Vice President, which is an offspring of the Task Force on Regulatory Relief, uh, first con which first conceived the OMB regulatory review function. Now, under this proposal, the Attorney General could, for example, block a regulation of a HUD helping low-income families acquire housing if the Attorney General determined that HUD did not have adequate procedures for deciding whether the loss of revenue to builders was in fact a taking. Or the Attorney General could block Environmental Protection Agency regulations dealing with cleanup of uh, Superfund sites to protect public health because, again, the AG had not approved the EPA's procedures for assessing whether the disruption of the business was in fact a taking. The gentleman doesn't mind my interrupting. Please forgive me. Do you have a lot? Do you have a lot more in your statement? Because you're, uh, you're welcome to submit it. I mean, I, you can go on if you'd like to, John. I, it's just that I, we still I have only about have, the only members. other part that I'd want to bring to your attention, uh, uh, and I ask that we really uh, uh, just strike uh, the amendment because of germaneness is the section 104 uh, portion of the legislation, uh, which was reported. Uh, on July 26 from Public Works and Transportation and if alters greatly the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act as amended by the Budget Enforcement Act. Okay. Uh, that's the second part of my presentation. And in okay. effect, the section would transfer for scorekeeping purposes part of the highway construction program from domestic discretionary, discretionary caps to the PAYGO controls for mandatory spending. And under House Rule 10-1-J, uh, the Committee on Government Operations has, again, jurisdiction over such budgeting and accounting matters. But because of the wishes of the Speaker to move this legislation expeditiously, I did not seek a sequential referral of the reported legislation. I understand the Committee on Appropriations has also concerns about this provision. And I simply urge that we not try to bring this up on the House floor to open up uh, this measure uh, to extensive amendment. And I wanted to hear publicly assure both public works and appropriations that this is a matter that I expect that we address carefully during the conference uh, committee consideration, at which time I expect our committees, a member of our committee will be appointed to the conference committee. So at this time, I ask the Rules Committee uh, not to open this section for extensive amendments so that we can address it during conference. I, I, I think it's not our intention to do so, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to tell you also, first of all, we appreciate your making a point of this, because as you all, as you know, our committee here shares to a certain extent jurisdiction with your committee with you respect do. to these budget problems. So we, we appreciate your, your support for our our feelings about this particular matter. Now, do you have anything else to address? We will, without objection, no. take put in the record your entire statement. Thank you very much. Th those are the two matters. The, uh, the uh, proposal by the gentleman from Ohio, uh, which was referred to our committee, uh, has not had hearings. As a matter of fact, there were no requests for hearings. And it, it leads me to, to seek that it, that it would be your judgment, uh, notwithstanding his brilliant presence and membership on this committee that uh, that it be struck because of the, the violation of the rules that I cited. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will simply associate myself with the remarks of Chairman Conyers with respect to Mr. McEwen's amendment. And I do so also uh, in, in concert with Chairman Dingell and Chairman Ford 
uh, uh, and, and Walter Jones of the Merchant Marine Committee uh, for all of the reasons that Chairman Conyers has pointed out, the fact that this has not had hearings, that this is an incredibly far-sweeping proposal, uh, whether it's just another layer of bureaucracy or whether it's uh, much more mischievous than that is yet to, uh, to be determined. But to suggest that the Attorney General now is going to review and, and uh, have to sign off on all regulations of any nature to determine whether or not there is a taking uh, crosses over probably the jurisdiction of each and every committee, and that's the purpose of the Governmental Organization Committee, uh, it is to sort that out as the implications. We have watched with interest over the last couple of months uh, as the Competitive Council has made rulings and determinations uh, about uh, various regulations that, uh, that it has glommed onto within the administration, and yet we can find no authority uh, for their ability to do so. Uh, for the creation of that, other than we know it's an outgrowth of the old uh, 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 presidential council that the, the, the now President uh, Bush was, was, was chair of. And, uh, and yet we also know there's an administrative procedures for the development of these regulations. We don't know if these regulations are being questioned or turned down based upon evidence or hunches or phone calls. And uh, now to suggest that the Attorney General is going to get those same, those same powers uh, is just, is just uh, uh, cannot be done in this legislation. There have been no hearings in the Senate. Uh, there have been no hearings in the House. Uh, and uh, I would, excuse me, also I'd say that Chairman Brooks of the Judiciary Committee also uh, opposes this effort, and we would hope that you would not grant a waiver to make this amendment in order. Thank you also, Mr. Chairman. Uh, questions? Mr. Solomon. Yeah. I don't have a question, but I would just point out to uh, Mr. Conyers and Mr. Miller uh, as well that uh, uh, I've had this same legislation this, as the Sims Amendment pending before the Government Operations Committee and the Judiciary Committee for many years. And my good friend Jack Brooks has always seen to it that uh, the bill never saw the light of day. And I think that's really one of the problems here. Uh, uh, it's a real problem for farmers across the country, and uh, we all know what kind of condition they are in. And uh, the New York State Farm Bureau, the American Farm Bureau, really would like to have this issue aired uh, in both bodies, and yet uh, we don't have those hearings, and I personally have requested the hearings. I have not as yet with you, Mr. Conyers, but I will, and uh, I can't speak for Mr. McEwen and his piece of legislation, but it's a very serious matter, and we really should have the hearings and, and air it before the Congress because it's such an important issue to s such a large segment of the, of the country, particularly farmers. No, said good job. You but both you said. can't. You, I, my response would be that this Congress cannot pass an unconstitutional no. law to, to take of uh, taking. So the, there really is no issue. There well, is an issue out there and, in the and, country. Uh, let's air that, that constitutionality yeah. of it and, and prove it. I'd be yeah, but we can't do that on the floor in, the, in, this, in this amendment. Thanks very much. Mr. Quillen or Mr. McEwen? No question, but it has to have both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. thank you. I'm sorry to put both of you through this this afternoon, but I appreciate your presentation. Mr. Conyers, uh, my bill was referred only to government operations, and, uh, and I have requested hearings, and I'm delighted and appreciate very much that your response to Mr. Solomon that you intend to hold hearings, and I'm, I uh, look forward to, I think that this is really important to a lot of people, and the reason this is in this bill, in the Senate legislation that's going to conference, is because it does impact a great deal, uh, a number of people, not in the not in the urban areas, but in the rural areas, uh, by regulations, people are having their operations totally wiped out of existence. And as that is becoming a tool for many different groups, it's important that we be able to make sure that, uh, that it is legislatively sound, if at all. And so I thank you for your hearing. And again, uh, regret that you had to be here for so long to, no problem. yeah. It may be your way of bringing it to our attention. Who, who knows? <laughs> thank you both. Thank you. We thank you both. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coughlin, I think, is next on our list. Is Mr. Walker with you, Bob? Are you here, or are you in a separate matter? Okay, we'll take Mr. Coughlin, then. I think you're next on our list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is indeed a difficult way to consider a very major piece of legislation, and if it is to be subject to a restrictive rule, I have two amendments that I would ask be it made It may be order. subject to such a rule, so please talk about your and, amendments. Uh, they are both amendments that would plug ex loopholes in the existing law. Uh, the first amendment 
requires states to establish and implement a safety program for fixed guideway mass transportation not regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration. It's important to recognize that fixed guideway systems such as trolleys and light commuter rail systems currently fall between the cracks. They're regulated by nobody in terms of safety. Uh, what the proposal that I have had uh, before the committee uh, would require is that states designate an agency responsible for safety uh, and to require a review and approve and monitor implementation of safety plans for those fixed guideway systems and to investigate hazardous conditions and accidents that require uh, corrective action. The penalty for states not doing so uh, is exactly the same as the penalty that uh, uh, your colleague Mr. Solomon has uh, for failure to revoke driver's licenses of those convicted of drug offenses, and that is withholding of highway trust funds, uh, highway funds under the exact same language that Mr. Solomon has. Um, this is a recommendation, Mr. Chairman, of the National Transportation Safety Board. It's uh, supported in principle by the administration. Uh, Urban uh, Mass Transportation Administrator Brian Clymer said a process of independent safety audit and oversight of local public transportation is vital, and it's to remedy this small part of transportation that falls between the cracks, uh, the, the safety aspects of that, uh, that I would seek to have this amendment approved. But it is an area, if I may interrupt for a moment, is, to, is it not, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, that, that in fact some programs in which are authorized by the bill? Um, I, mean, not, I don't mean the safety part, I mean the, the programs themselves. Not the safety themselves. part. Uh, it, it, uh, the bill does uh, talk about mass transit, right. but uh, the safety part of fixed guideway mass transit is, is uh, not regulated by anybody, and this would uh, require the states to have an agency designated responsible right. for the safety of that fixed guideway Can mass transit. Can you tell us, Larry, if, if this suggestion of yours was before the, the authorizing committee? Yes, this was presented to the authorizing committee. Uh, we did present testimony to the authorizing committee. Um, and I, uh, Congressman Borski and I jointly presented this, and as a matter of fact, to the authorizing committee. And have you spoken to them? I'm, these are only little suggestions here in case other things can't be worked out. I have spoken um, to Chairman Rowe about, uh, about their, about their, their block amendments. Here, uh, before this and, and uh, hope that we might include this amendment. Uh, in his on block amendments. Uh, in that or as a separate amendment. That might be, you know, an easier route for you to go, so I can only suggest you keep working mm -hmm. on it. You've got another amendment. You want the the to second about. amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, is another uh, uh, loophole in the law, uh, which would give the uh, Urban Mass Transportation uh, Administration the authority to promulgate drug testing regulations. Although five anti-drug programs have been upheld in other transportation modes, uh, the UMTA was held by the District Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia uh, not to have the authority to issue uh, drug rules uh, for recipients of mass transportation assistance. Mr. Chairman, the public is entitled to have drug-free mass transit uh, in the same way it's entitled to have uh, other forms of uh, uh, transportation be drug-free. All of those other forms uh, have uh, drug testing regulations in place. Only mass transit uh, doesn't have that authority. Now, the UMTA rules that were promulgated but held by the court to be invalid because UMTA didn't have the authority to issue them uh, were in similar to other modes in every material respect. Uh, in this case, the court did not say that uh, the empty drug rule was flawed or unnecessary. It only said that the, the uh, Congress had not authorized UMTA to act. This would create that authority in UMTA to issue those regulations similar to every other mode of transportation uh, to require drug testing. And as I said, uh, though the riders of mass transit have the same right to uh, safe transportation as uh, other uh, modes of transportation. Well, this member who is not always in support of such programs strongly supports them in this area and is surprised that, that there hasn't been specific authorization for it. Again, was, was the authorizing committee approached with this idea? Uh, the, the, the authorizing committee was approached with this idea. I might say, Mr. Chairman, uh, this has passed the House in motions to instruct it, has passed the Senate 11 times in one form or, for, one form or another, and it's important that it be brought before this body as part of this legislation, which is major legislation, Mr. Chairman, and, and we should be allowed to consider these two uh, proposals uh, as part of this very major uh, service transportation legislation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> just my point. Of, you know, first of all, let me just commend you, Larry, for the, for the great job that you do. Uh, you know I'm extremely interested in, in the drug testing issue. Um, it, when you consider what happened uh, uh, down in South Carolina, I think it was just last night, uh, the serious problems we have, it's a shame that this is a loophole and, and we've never been able to, to plug it. And uh, I would advise you to, to really go and seek uh, uh, the support of uh, Chairman Rowe and, uh, and uh, John Paul Hammersmith, uh, the ranking Republican, 
because as I understand it, uh, and this, this probably will, will help kill the bill, but uh, uh, I think there are about 50 or 60 amendments uh, about to be rolled into this in block amendment, and most of them, 40 or so, will never have even come before this rules committee. We don't have any idea what's in those amendments. But uh, I don't believe that uh, much of anything is going to be made in order for debate on the floor. So we, we really are going to have to push with, the, with Chairman Rowe, and I'll help you do that, because I really do think it's terribly important we get that amendment in. I, I think both of these amendments are, are tremendously important. And that's why I said it's very difficult to consider such a major exactly. bill in this way, because there are amendments like these or, or proposals like these that, that really need to be, well, be we, we fixed. We agree with Mr. Coffin. The problem is that there are a handful of what seems to us as as in this particular case to you, to be very useful amendments which one way or another have not made their way into the bill. And unfortunately, at least at the moment, because it's a big bill and time pressures are, are providing some real constraints on us, the, the preferred method of getting them into the bill, hopefully, is through the en bloc amendment. Well, uh, I have talked so, to Chairman Rowe. So we'll keep leaning on your friends, hope, uh, keep leaning on your friends well. on the committee that seems to me they shouldn't have any serious problems with either of these bills, uh, either of these amendments. Mr. Gordon, do you have any questions for this no. witness? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Oh, forgive me. Forgive me, Mr. Quillen. I'm sorry, I have no question. Thank nice, you. Nice to have you, Larry. Thanks for you. Oh, thanks. Mr. Chairman, no, sir. I come before you asking you to make an order or an amendment to strike the anti-automobile title of the bill. If uh, that sounds uh, a little... Which one? The anti-automobile... Uh, title of the bill. If that sounds a little pejorative, the, name of the, title the statement the is, yeah, well, I, I will describe the title in a minute, Mr. Chairman. You'll see why there is some concern about, uh, about uh, uh, the particular title to which I'm referring. Uh, my statement is uh, about it being anti-automobile is based upon two facts. Uh, title V is, uh, of the legislation is terribly ill-defined. And uh, second, the testimony of those who helped create the concept is distinctly anti-automobile. If you look at the bill and you look at Title V, you will find that it's labeled the Intermodal Transportation System. I have tried like the devil to We're find out. We're not sure what that means either. But yeah, I've tried like the devil to find out what it means. As long as the members of the committee do, we figure that's enough. Well, um, I, um, I thought at first it sounded a little like something that we were spanked for in elementary school. And uh, since I haven't found um, uh, anything to uh, determine Some of us otherwise, didn't get into it's a trouble problem. in elementary school, Mr. Walker, but I'm sure perhaps you might have. <laughs> I didn't. Um, the problem with this title, Mr. Mr. Chairman, is that uh, if you look at the record of the committee, uh, you will find out that uh, in the uh, committee report, there is practically no discussion whatsoever of this. There is less than one page of discussion of what we're doing. And yet, in this title, we are creating a brand new office in the Department of Transportation known as the Office of Intermodalism. Uh, and we are creating a new director for that office. We are uh, uh, giving that director a billion dollars to spend over the next five years. And we're doing so with no background whatsoever and with absolutely no indication uh, of what uh, all of this uh, may mean. There are no definitions for what this uh, director is supposed to do. There are no definitions uh, for uh, the, the concepts involved. And the, the committee report gives us absolutely no um, a way of determining uh, what uh, uh, is going to be involved. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we ought not proceed ahead uh, with that kind of, of a um, uh, situation uh, to, uh, under the guise of, um, uh, of this bill. And um, from what I can determine from the members of the committee, uh, there was practically uh, nothing ever raised in the hearings that this uh, particular title emerged uh, at the time of the markup of the bill uh, without uh, any real discussion uh, by the members. Uh, I think that that's a poor way to proceed, particularly since it appears as though the director of this office will have as his most distinctive role an attempt to force Americans out of their automobiles and into other forms of transportation. Uh, I think to make such a major uh, kind of decision about a, a part of the economy that tri contributes one job out of every six uh, to our national uh, uh, job health uh, is uh, a decision that ought not be made uh, without at least some discussion and some debate. Uh, the only way we are evidently going to have that discussion, that debate, is to make an amendment such as mine uh, uh, available on the floor for us to at least get the committee to define what they mean by this concept and define for uh, the country what it is they're doing. If we do not have such a discussion, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that we are going to proceed ahead with this um, uh, intermodalism concept 
with no definition and with a cost to the taxpayers of a billion dollars and a brand new office at the Department of Transportation. Well, for a while there, I was sympathetic to what you're suggesting until you started describing it as a means of getting people out of cars. That's exactly what we need to do in some areas of the country, obviously not your own, where it's, it's completely, virtually completely dependent on cars. Well, there are, there are some people who contend uh, that that's the case, Mr. Chairman. And my guess is that there are uh, literally millions of Americans who see their private automobile as a, an extension of personal freedom uh, and uh, who do not want the federal government uh, in the business of trying to force them out of their cars. Uh, and it appears as though that's the direction in, in which we're headed. But um, whether you agree with that concept or not, I hope you would at least agree, as a committee, that the matter ought to be discussed, uh, that, uh, that this is not something that, that ought to be uh, allowed to uh, become a part of uh, the Department of Transportation without there at least have been uh, some discussion as to whether or not it's a good idea. As I say, particularly when one job in every six in this country is dependent upon the automobile as, as a principal means of, uh, of transportation. Questions? Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Bob, I've discussed with you many times uh, <clears throat> it, it is needed. We're going to do everything we can to make it in order, uh, but uh, that's unlikely. Uh, but if we don't do something, we're not going to have a bill, and, uh, and certainly your, your amendment needs to be debated on the floor. Thank you. Mr. Gordon, any questions? Sir? No questions. Mr. Clark? Thank you, Bob. Nice to have you here. As always, you make a very persuasive argument. I didn't realize that there'd been no discussion in committee on this at all. At least we have nothing. Is it mentioned in the report? I haven't read the it. The report has less than one page on this entire concept. I mean, we are creating a brand new billion dollar office in the Department of Transportation with literally one page uh, of material on it in the committee report and, uh, and pages in the, in the uh, bill that if you read, you will end up thoroughly confused as to what uh, they mean. Did you say a billion or a million? A billion. A billion dollar office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don't be in it, I'm so key. Let me say I appreciate your testimony, Bob, and uh, would emphasize again that while there are those that speak contemptuously of automobiles and say that uh, there's rapid rail systems elsewhere around the world, we had rail systems 100 years ago, too. And uh, the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and those that longed for the ultimate accomplishment was to have their own car to have a Pullman that traveled at the time when they wanted to go where they wanted to go. We now in America, the average person has two or three of those that leaves when he wants to leave at the time and temperature they want to listening to the music they wish to listen to. And that's no small accomplishment for a very wealthy, productive society. It's important we keep them safe and allow the mobility that is a marvelous, marvelous addition to our standard of living. And to spend a billion dollars to do it in seems uh, questionable at late, uh, should at least merit a hearing. If the gentleman will yield, I think we also need to keep in mind that we spent two billion dollars a day in the Persian Gulf. Now, we were there for a variety of reasons, uh, but certainly the production of oil in that part of the country was one of them. So the gentleman um, will join me in support of ANWR and we'll solve this problem. Well, Thank you very much. What does that give about, does that give 30 days or 60 days worth of our, of the United States' so oil supply? Coupled with, it, coupled with legislation to prevent production of energy so, offshore and onshore. Since yeah, it was my time, I would observe that it, the purpose of produ producing energy was not the goal of the legislation well, here. Let me, let me say that, that there are all kinds of options for the private automobile for the future. There's hydrogen fuel, there, there are electric cars, there are a number of things. But the problem with this particular concept and what we seem to be promoting here is, is the idea that the, uh, that the individual private ownership of an automobile and the personal freedom that goes with that is to be eliminated in favor of a whole host of other things where the government has control of people's uh, travel rather well, than this, people themselves. And, and that, is, uh, that is, I think, a major, a major concern. Well, Mr. Chairman, you say it's not. There have been no hearings. There is nothing in the committee report to indicate you know that. The chaps on the committee, they what, love automobiles what, too what much. Does, That's part of our problem. What does, <laughs> what does intermodalism mean, oh, Mr. Chairman? Well, go ask the people who put well, it the, in the there. The people who, a, who put it together on the committee are not able to define it for me. I have asked several of them, and there is no definition for this. Uh, and uh, well, the people who have studied is, the I issue. I think you're more worried than you need to be about well, this. Well, thing. Let, me, let me suggest to you I'm that not, if, you read, if you read from the folks who are promoting this idea, um, uh, the uh, campaign for the new transportation priorities, uh, believes a significant uh, portion of the problems associated with transportation stem from the unnecessary single occupant car use and over-reliance in general on the automobile for personal travel. 
Well, I uh, agree th with these, these are the people who are... You're talking about people like me. I feel like that. Okay, and I'm... So would you if you came from Los Angeles. Well, I'm... No, I, I, I will tell you that I think you to most get out of people in car. Los Angeles... We're just asking you to end your testimony so we can get on to the next guy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to do that. All I'm, all I'm hopeful of is we managed to get a, uh, a, a little bit of uh, consideration for an amendment that I think uh, needs to be understood as a billion-dollar uh, problem. Mr. Frost. I missed the gentleman's testimony, and I apologize for that. But is, is the gentleman uh, opposing the, the project of his Republican colleague from Altoona, Mr. Schuster? Is that what he's talking no, about? No, I'm, I'm opposing chapter, chapter 5 of the bill, or Title 5 of the bill, uh, the intermodalism section uh, of the bill, uh, which creates a brand new office of intermodalism. Uh, and um, I, I assume what we are going to do is see the USA intermodal A if uh, we uh, end up uh, approving this particular uh, a section of the bill. I, I seem to remember so, reading somewhere that Mr. Schuster had some money in for a mass transit a monorail or something like that in Altoona, and I was just curious if that was what he was speaking against. Yeah. Well, uh, the gentleman you? Yes. Some people are making light of your testimony, Bob, but on behalf of the taxpayers of this nation and on behalf of rural America that I represent, I support you 100%. I'm going to move to make your amendment in order. Please keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You rural guys can stay in your cars as long as you'd like. you like. All right with the rest of us. And you bet your life, we will too. And your guns and whatever else uh -huh. you need. Yeah. <laughs> with our 45. Yeah, I think <laughs> Mr. Cooper is next on our list. Uh, we'll keep our guns too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be before you. I would like to ask you to not make the Petri Klug amendment in order, at least as a separate amendment for the committee. First argument is I feel it will be adequate for them to include their approach in the motion to recommit. The only people who spoke in favor of their approach in this hearing today were Republicans. That's not to say that all Republicans support their approach. For example, I'm delighted to have the support of Jimmy Quillen on my approach, my bill, H.R. 1782, which was incorporated in its entirety, not only in the House Highway Bill, but also in the Senate Bill. For that matter, Mr. Walker is also a co-sponsor of, uh, of my approach. Second argument is this. The Petri Klug Amendment does not offer us a significant policy choice, and the outcome is not in doubt. These gentlemen, or Mr. Petri in particular, since he serves on Public Works, did not offer this even as an amendment in full committee in the markup. Most everyone knows, including the General Accounting Office, which has just surveyed all the scientific studies on this issue, that helmet laws do work. I would be happy to supply uh, this committee with uh, the GAO report. When you understand the approach that's in the highway bill, it does not force helmet laws on the states. We have been over backwards to grant states flexibility. Our approach is an incentive-based approach. It is not a punitive approach. A state at no point is forced to pass a helmet law if a state chooses not to pass such a law. We do say, if you know a better way to save lives and money, why then do it and spend 3% of your highway money on that new approach. And safety education is wonderful. I'm all for it. I would hope that states would do that. There's no real question here, if you listen to the testimony of the witnesses, they are not advocating the libertarian argument of it being wrong for the federal government to require seat belt or motorcycle helmet use. They're making a much more limited argument. The argument they made is, let's require these things of minors, people under 21, but let's let adults choose. And that's an argument that sounds very sensible on the surface. But think of the enforcement problems. Say you're a highway patrolman and you see somebody go by you at 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, probably with sunglasses on, probably with their hair blowing in the wind. At least if they didn't have a helmet, you'd have a better chance of guessing their age than if they did. Well, it's still <laughs> quite hard to guess whether someone is 21 or 22 or 18 or 25. It puts our law enforcement officers in an impossible position. And finally, Mr. Chairman, this is a very tricky amendment because it looks as if it would save lives of minors and let adults choose on their own. If you look at the statistics, though, 90 percent of traffic fatalities involving motorcycles are people 18 years of age and older. 90 percent of the victims would not be helped by this law. And the minors 
the folks under age would not be helped either. Let me submit for the record a letter from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, a letter dated July 22, 1991, which says, age-specific helmet use laws have little or no impact on the age group concerned. So I would urge the members of this committee to follow the recommendations of the administration in this regard and to reject the Petri Klug Amendment. As one of our colleagues, Mike Parker, a former undertaker by profession, put it so well in committee. He's still taking orders. He's still taking orders. And if we don't pass this bill, we may be taking more orders. He said that the premise of these age-specific helmet use laws is that our heads grow tougher as we grow older, which is, of course, an absolutely false premise. Finally, Mr. Chairman, this is an emotional issue, and most members do not want a recorded vote on this issue. I have lobbied almost every member of this House in person. We have 147 co-sponsors. The vast majority of members support the legislation. They don't necessarily want their name on it as a co-sponsor, although a majority of this committee has been brave enough to do that. Many of our colleagues are worried about uh, bikers. Uh, many of my colleagues are worried about the perception that state legislators do not like our approach even though we have a letter from the governor's safety representatives indicating not only that they like our approach, they love our approach because it saves states money, it grants states flexibility. So I would just urge this committee to um, disallow, to not make in order, the Petri Klug Amendment. Uh, questions? Jerry, good morning. Yeah. Well, come back to you, Mr. Quillen. Thank you. I'm delighted to have a, my colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, with us. I'm delighted to co-sponsor your bill, and I think you've made a very persuasive argument in regard to the Petri Amendment, and uh, made very few amendments made in order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Who's, who's Can you talk to him, Joe? The Honorable Dan Glickman. He's our right time. Matthew Martinez. Howard Berman. Without objection, without his, he hopes, he hopes to have his included in the unblock amendment. Without objection, the statement of Howard Berman will appear in its entirety in the record in the event that he does come back, we will allow him to testify if we're still hearing witnesses. Honorable Jim Johns of Indiana. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Sorry. members of the committee. Um, I'm asking uh, for the uh, approval of a rule which will allow uh, offering of a one-sentence amendment uh, which uh, says that with regard to federal aid projects other than interstate highways or national highway system highways, that states be allowed to use their own standards for design and construction. Uh, the reason for this is to allow states to make the money they have go as far as possible. Uh, this particular amendment is in the Senate version of the bill. It's supported, uh, the provision is supported by the administration. Um, and um, the uh, uh, committee at this time has not taken a position uh, on the amendment uh, as, as drafted, but um, I uh, am, am uh, hopeful that we'll be able to uh, work out something that's uh, Did you agreeable. present the amendment to the committee, uh, Mr. Jones? Well, I did not. I, uh, the, the, the amendment was included as part of the FAST proposal, which was before the committee. Um, and I did speak to the chairman today, and I, the impression I got is that uh, it was an issue that, uh, that uh, was not addressed or, or discussed, um, in part because of the overwhelming load that the committee faced. In, uh, preparing the bill. But I think it's an amendment that uh, allows... Well, did you inform him that it was in the Senate version? I'm sorry? Did you inform him yes. that it was in... Yes, I did. Did you ask him if he would protect it in conference? I, I did not. Okay. All right. Any questions of Mr. Johns? Mr. Derrick? No, no questions. Mr. Solomon? No questions. Well, Mr. Dreyer? Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you getting tired? The Honorable Robert Torticelli. Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Mr. Chairman, this legislation contains language that would freeze 
the usage of triple trailers in the United States. It is a compromise. It also, in my judgment, is not good enough. If ever there were a case of interstate commerce that should be governed by the laws of the nation in a uniform fashion, it is the size, the weight, the usage of large trucks. This legislation doesn't do that. I'm asking the committee to make an order, an amendment, which will have a uniform national system to govern the size of trucks at 65 feet, two trailers. It is aimed, members of the committee, specifically at something that is happening around this country. And if the polls are to be believed, is objected to by over 90% of the American people. Triple trailers. And they are a threat to every American family. This, Mr. Chairman, is not the case of a member coming before you for a local interest. I would venture to say that I represent more of the American trucking industry than any other individual member of Congress from anywhere. That's not the question. It's not an economic or a local interest question. It is a danger question. Allow me for a moment just to describe to you just how serious I think this is. Trucks having two or more trailers have a 66% higher fatal accident rate nationwide. They are 4.3 times more likely to turn over. Their rates of accidents are generally twice as high. And the reason for this should be quite obvious. This, Mr. Chairman, is the braking distance of a triple truck. If a triple truck were going the speed limit, something, a proposition which I think in many cases in the country can be doubted, if it were going the speed limit, and if it had cold brakes, had not been operating for a long period of time, which I think can also be doubted, on a wet pavement, it requires 900 feet to stop a triple trailer. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, on a wet road, with warm brakes going over 60 miles an hour, it can require a quarter of a mile to stop one of these trucks. It is wrong to do, and it is not safe. I know some people can save some money operating these trucks, but four times the accident rates, double the fatalities on our roads, it simply doesn't make any sense. Double trailers, which under my amendment would be allowed, are enough. The jackknifing, the accidents, the braking, the reasons I think are manifold that this shouldn't be allowed. But frankly, Mr. Chairman, the interests that are against this are enormous. There's a great deal at stake in allowing these. I need an amendment to allow this to go to the floor, or this simply will not ever happen. But I think we all know where the American people would be on this question. And it is overwhelmingly in favor of stopping this abuse. Finally, for those of you, all of us, in fact, who are faced with the enormous questions of funding this bill, let me remind you of this. There isn't a highway in America that was ever engineered for a 120,000 pound truck. We are ripping our highways to pieces. And you can see it all across this country. A triple trailer truck loaded not only takes a quarter of a mile to stop, it rips pavement up coast to coast, 120,000 pounds. It should be stopped. And I'm asking the committee for the opportunity to wage the fight to stop it. Bob, did you have any uh, uh, talk about anybody regarding uh, tr uh, cement trucks did anybody talk to you about cement trucks? Would this adversely affect cement trucks? As I originally wrote the amendment, I had a weight provision in it of 90,000. And I, I did that because of my fear of danger for roads. Right. It was pointed out to me that there are garbage trucks, cement trucks, and even some fire trucks that, that can exceed that limit. So This wouldn't affect them? I preferred to deal with it. The amendment doesn't deal with it. I limited it to triples, because although the weight is a danger, it is having those extra hinge, uh, hinges, the, the trailer hooks, that causes the jackknifing and some of the worst dangers. So I only dealt with the triple trailers. I did not the, deal with those. How others. do the trucking unions feel about this? 
I would think they'd be in favor of your amendment. The uh, workers unions, the Teamsters, yeah. Yeah. are in favor of it, with the exception, to be frank with members of the committee, of the Philadelphia Teamsters. There's a fight going on between the Port of New York and the Port of Philadelphia. The, what we're creating here is a competition among states. My state does not allow this. Frankly, if you don't allow this, it has no impact on New Jersey. We don't allow them in New Jersey. But what you're setting up is they now can go to the Port of Philadelphia, but not to the Port of New York. So there's an advantage of trucking companies going to Philadelphia. We lose the business. The pressure you put on the state, le state legislature of New Jersey is you've got to allow this or we lose the business. And at some point, that'll happen. And that's true with many of your states, including California today doesn't allow it. I'll bet you you do in a few years because you're not going to take the economic loss. Level the playing field on it. Let's deal with it nationally. That's why we're here as a national legislature, to have common rules. Any questions? Mr. Billingson. No, I, I agree 100 percent, Bob. My only quick question is, has, has the committee in its bill that we have before us done anything with respect to this general question of, of length or weight of trucks? The know? committee has uh, frozen things where they are. Which means that 15 uh, prevented states. prevented from becoming worse. Well, except, in, as, you, as you say, there is pressure on state legislatures be, themselves to allow So it. it is open to states. As it stands now. It was the intention of federal law that this be frozen in 1956. The problem is, as the law has been interpreted, states are their own interpreter of what their laws were then. So they have gone back and year by year, more and more states. If we had been meeting, I think, five or ten years ago, Michigan was the only state that has these legally. Amazingly, a 1956 grandfather clause has allowed 20 states to now come in. The doors open everywhere, including, Mr. Chairman, those poor people who are going to Western Massachusetts for weekend vacations have to drive back on the Massachusetts Turnpike now with triple, tra triple trailers. Remind me, I won't drive the Turnpike. <laughs> I have trouble with the double trailers myself. Mr. Quillen. No question. Mr. Dreyer. Chairman, just uh, briefly, uh, Bob, I'm, I'm curious to know wh what kind of we, you know, trying to balance off safety along with the economic impact. And safety is the priority, and I'm certainly one to underscore that. But as we look at the economic consequences, I've gotten um, a message from the people with United Parcel Service who are very concerned about this, and I wondered how you respond to uh, some of the criticism that uh, different groups have. I'm not going to argue to you that there is not some economic loss. Uh, having one driver haul three trailers, or eventually four, five, or six, is always going to be less expensive, except for the taxpayer who has to fix the roads. But for that company, it will always be less expensive. But when you see today the size of these double trailers, the amount of freight that can be carried in them, I do not feel that we've put an onerous burden on it. Frankly, if every company in the country was like UPS, we probably wouldn't be dealing with this because they have three trailers, but they're very small with very professional drivers. Nobody ever alleged that a UPS driver was uh, not professional or that the trucks weren't well maintained. But that's not always true. You've got sole operators who are going to be out there driving all hours of the night with triple trailers requiring a quarter of a mile to stop a truck. This just makes no sense. And I know UPS because the professional won't overload these trucks. But some people will. And all along, they're going to break bridges and roads right behind them across the country. So if you're looking to assure you that there's no economic cost, I can't do that, yeah. except in the aggregate, when you put the taxpayers in it. Put the taxpayers in it, John. and I think it's an economic saving. I think it's just, it seems to me to be a, kind of a sad thing when you have them vigorously opposing this. And, you know, here we agree that, that they're an entity that's trying to responsibly and professionally deal with the issue, the fact that they feel as if they'd be penalized. And I just wish that we could work out. I just don't know how to some, deal with that, yeah, David. I, I don't I just, think there is a way. It, yeah. Unfortunately, the bad becomes the enemy were. of the good. Yeah. Uh, they will just have to, uh, in those states where they're now dealing with triples, bring it down to doubles. It's something I'm certain that they can absorb for safety, economic purposes. But you just said that you really don't believe that safety is an issue in the case of United Parcel Service. In UPS, I do not believe yeah. that it is. And so you're saying that they should absorb it in the name They'll of safety. They'll have to for the larger safety concern of the whole industry. They become, but that's, you know, that's true in our society. People, unfortunately, who will abuse or not professionally deal with a right or a privilege uh, cause problems for those who do. And that, this is one of those instances, unfortunately, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.
No questions. We, the slaughter. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The Honorable Peter Hoagland. Ron, are you waiting to testify? Your name's not on the list. That's why. I... Where? Oh, it's written on. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Mr. Hoagland. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your uh, continuing to receive testimony this late in the day. Um, I'm offering as an amendment to this bill, for, for your consideration, a bill that uh, Congressman Glickman and I and others have introduced, H.R. Uh, 2950, I'm sorry, 2717, <laughs> called the Highway Tree Planting Initiative of 1991. And what the bill does is it creates a $10 million grant program out of the $10 billion or so highway trust fund for states to choose to apply to implement a tree planting program. Now, many states in the country don't need this, of course, because their highways in Massachusetts, I've noticed from driving up there and seeing my in-laws, are sufficiently forested. But there are many, many states that aren't. Uh, in Nebraska, for instance, we only have a tree cover of about 1.5%. And nationwide, only about 5% of our primary forest remains intact. So what this provision would do is it would allow states on an 80-20 cost-sharing basis to apply for grants up to $500,000 in one year. No state can apply for more than $500,000 in order to plant trees along federally sponsored roads, uh, interstates, and other primary highways. Now, there are a lot of obvious reasons for this, and it doesn't make sense for me to take a lot of the committee's time talking about it, but a couple of obscure facts that are of interest. Uh, uh, trees can provide a form a carbon sink. One acre of trees, for instance, absorbs 2.6 tons of carbon dioxide a year. Uh, in a global warming situation, which we're entering into, it'll be very beneficial. In Nebraska, during the Depression, we had shelter belts that were built up along many of the highways. And uh, those, a lot of them are being cut down. But those that remain are really extraordinarily beautiful. There are a few as we travel the highways in Nebraska. And uh, I would like to make it possible, and Congressman Glickman and other co-sponsors of the bill would like to make possible uh, a grant program so that states can ap apply for funds from the Highway Trust Fund without having to choose between trees and other uses. The problem right now, of course, is if a state decides to build trees while it's deciding not to use the same funds for concrete and other purposes, so trees seem to wind up on the short end of the stick. In any event, uh, I'd be pleased to attempt to answer questions any of you might have. Ellison, again, Mr. Chairman, something that I think most of us agree with very, very strongly, and the gentleman's not asking, the three gentlemen, are not asking very much at all. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny amount out of the larger amount. Have you, have you spoken with Mr. Rowe and his friends about the possibility of including in their on block amendment? We, we have not done that yet, Mr. Bielenson, but I, I will. It I will seems do so. to be the most possible, you know, the best possible road of getting nice little suggestions such as yours in. Seems to me, well, suggested some members of the committee here, you know, feel kindly toward it. Uh, it's not asking very much of them, and I really I can't imagine that they wouldn't perhaps be sympathetic themselves. I don't know. I will but it's probably the better. The, the best way to go, I would guess, huh, Mr. Chairman? Because right. not agree. an awful lot of little amendments are going to be allowed, okay. probably. Mr. Solomon. No, thank you very much. Mr. Gordon. Questions. Mr. Dreyer. No, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Slaughter. Actually, were you here when um, uh, Mike uh, Andrews testified? I was. Mm -hmm. Where they allowed the cutting down of trees because they were hiding illegally erected billboards? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's certainly the trend in Nebraska. I mean, the State Highway Department goes out and cuts down volunteer trees all over the place that are beyond the clear zone required for safety for reasons that are inexplicable. Clearly, the trend in, in the country is to cut down trees, not to plant them. And, and one problem we have is that, uh, is, is that I think a lot of highway departments think it's more economical not to have trees because you have mowing problems. Mm. Particularly when trees are small, it's hard to get them going. So, because the mowers can take them out. So, I think it's important to put these kind of incentives in the statute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. The Honorable Ron Wyden. Clark Booker. Yeah. You're going to be available tonight, Tom. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's late. Uh, 
late in the day, Mr. Chairman, so no, no filibuster from, uh, from me uh, this evening. Well, you've been uh, so patient, we'll even waive the five-minute rule. No, no, uh, no five minutes either, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your grac graciousness. What uh, the amendment that I seek to offer uh, involves is energy conservation. And we know that uh, this is a, a transportation bill. We call it the Surface Transportation Act. But for all practical purposes, we could probably call it a major energy bill uh, as well, because 63 percent of all the oil that we use uh, in transportation uh, is, of course, uh, uh, going to this uh, uh, critical, uh, critical sector. So I seek to uh, offer an amendment that I, I think is simple and uh, pretty non-controversial. It says simply that when uh, we go forward in this country with transportation projects at the state uh, and local level, there would have to be some uh, consideration of the energy conservation potential of those uh, projects not anticipated that this kind of uh, approach be a cumbersome and, uh, and bureaucratic one. Uh, I would not favor, for example, something like an energy conservation impact statement or something that could delay important uh, energy uh, and transportation projects. But it seems to me, at a minimum, we should make sure that when we're going forward with projects, there ought to be some uh, consideration of the energy uh, impact if you take, uh, as my view, that when you're passing a transportation bill, you're essentially uh, passing a transportation uh, uh, bill as, uh, as well, simply because 63 percent of all that oil uh, in the United States goes to the transportation sector. Mr. Chairman, let me end my orating uh, at this point. Uh, some of uh, your colleagues have asked about uh, uh, the matter of discussing this with uh, the committee. I've done that at length. Um, for all practical purposes, I think it would have been accepted in the committee. There was, I think, some concern that it might have been sent to another uh, committee that uh, has an interest uh, in policy uh, matters uh, in this area. But it's on the committee that it wasn't accepted because of the possible of sequestration and therefore would send the whole bill to another committee? I, I, I think the biggest concern, Mr. Chairman, was a referral. Uh, I sit on the Energy uh, and Commerce uh, Committee. We have. Uh, special interest uh, in these matters. We've talked to Mr. Mineta's staff at some length. Uh, you certainly uh, sound them out for uh, uh, on your own, but they've been most supportive. The staff, Mr. Mineta has talked to me, been, been supportive. And it just seems to me, at a minimum, if we're going to spend billions of dollars on transportation in this country, let's at least consider, in a non-burdensome sort of way, what the energy conservation impact <coughs> is going to be. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hockbrookner. I'm here to request that uh, you make an amendment in order. Uh, it's uh, based on my bill, H.R. 2975, and I just introduced it last week. It is a, a late starter. I have been working with the committee. I'm hopeful that it can be part of the, an in block amendment, but if not, I would hope that you would make it in order. And basically, uh, it is what I refer to as the Motorist Frustration Reduction Act. It's uh, only two pages in terms of bills, but virtually every American has experienced the frustration and the anger associated with uh, congestion, associated with construction. And, uh, you know, how often have we driven along and been coned down into one lane from two lanes or three lanes? only to find virtually nothing going on when we get to the end of the congestion. And when one considers the frustration, the stress, the fuel waste, the environmental pollution problems that come from it, um, it's a major problem. And in doing my homework, I came to the conclusion that in the Highway uh, Act itself, there's virtually no consideration given in the, to the motorists themselves. Most of the action is, here's the money, go spend it, repair the roads. Virtually no one takes into consideration the stress and strain of the frustrated motorists. And so what I've done is some homework and basically come up with a very straightforward bill that basically says that any federally aided project uh, should try to maximize the flow and minimize the congestion associated with construction. And the way to do it is to encourage off-peak construction activity, minimize lane closure, and in fact only close lanes when in fact you are working in those lanes, and also uh, uh, to provide a hotline number so that there'd be a posted 800 number so when people came upon this problem, if they felt the law was being violated, they could call an 800 number. There would be staffed by 
uh, each state, and they could say, you're right, uh, we're wrong, and we will pull the cones out or do whatever. But they'll so, probably block up traffic when they pull over to make the phone call. Well, the hope is that uh, most people don't have uh, a mobile phones, so I would suspect they'd find the phone. Or if they have a phone, they would I dial up instantly, you know, hopefully not having a problem and causing an accident while they're driving. But nevertheless, it seems to me that this is something we should offer to the frustrated motorists, and I ask you to consider making this uh, uh, and in, in order amendment to the bill, if I'm not able to convince the chairman that it's a worthy approach. Probably you should give them a roll of Thames at the toll gates, too, probably help a little bit. Well, that is uh, sort of, uh, I'd, I, I'd actually prefer to resolve the issue before the Thames are actually Any questions? necessary. Okay. Any questions? No, thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Appreciate your uh, effort here, Mr. Hawk Bruckner, and I will forever be indebted to you for the night that you were wielding the gavel in the chair downstairs and appreciated our debate on the fast track that was uh, going on. So that's why I'm very responsive to anything that you'd have to say up here. I appreciate your consideration, sir. Mr. McHugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other witnesses wishing to testify on HR 295? Uh, oh. Mr. Walker back on the phone. Model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if not, the, uh, the hearing part of the uh, uh, order is uh, finished. Uh, we will not, uh, uh, I don't anticipate it, uh, voting the rule out this evening. Uh, I have been notified there is a, an effort to try and get the ins unemployment insurance bill together, and I would appreciate very much if the members could uh, make themselves available uh, for at least three hours or so. And so I'd like to recess subject to call the chair. Just after yesterday's hearing, we spoke with a reporter for the Congressional Quarterly, Mike Mills. He spoke about what happened at the hearing and the status of the highway bill. Recently, C-SPAN's Viewer Information Department received these letters regarding our coverage of the federal courts. After watching for several days, the thought came to me that